Welcome to the ultimate guide to lens protocol. In this video, we'll be covering everything you need to know about lens, how it works and how to create a full stack web application built on top of the lens protocol using all of the latest and greatest technologies such as Next.js, TypeScript, GraphQL, React Query and ThirdWeb. By the end of the video, you'll have an awesome Web3 application with a social media feed page, a profile page and a page where you can create create new posts and publish them onto the Lens Protocol. We'll cover how Lens Protocol actually works, how to architecture awesome, robust Web3 applications from the smart contract layer to the off-chain layer to the application, all the way to the deployment of your application in this video. Before we dive into the build, feel free to check out the resources in the description. There'll be a guide on how to create a profile on the testnet and still use this video if you don't have a profile on the lens on Polygon mainnet just yet. There will also be a link to the full source code in the description. If you get stuck at any point, feel free to jump in there and check out the source code to follow along exactly with what I wrote in this video. There will also be a replit if you want to use the exact same versions as I did in this video. If you get stuck on any differences between any libraries that I use between now and any point in the future, jump into that replit and fork it and use the same exact versions as I did when I recorded this video so you don't have any problems there. There will also be links to Discord servers where you can ask questions if you get stuck in this video in the description. With that said, enjoy the video. I'm very excited to have you here. If you like it, remember to hit the like button. It does help me out a lot. Subscribe to the channel if you want to support me and see more content like this. With that said, enjoy the build and I hope to see you at the end. So what actually is Lens Protocol? It's a decentralized social graph, but what does that actually mean? The Lens Protocol is a way of storing your social media data on the blockchain and the relationships between social media profiles and social media content is represented in this social graph, which is stored on the blockchain in a decentralized manner. The best way to kind of describe what value Lens Protocol brings to the world is by comparing it to the problems with typical Web2 social media platforms, such as what's happening recently within Twitter. So when you take a very high level look at what Twitter actually consists of, you have Twitter, the company, which is managing Twitter, the web application, and Twitter, the database. So if we take a look at Twitter, which we can represent with Elon Musk's face here, this is Twitter, the company. So Twitter Incorporated is the actual company, Twitter. Twitter runs the application twitter.com or the Twitter mobile app. It's the same thing, really. We can call this Twitter app application. And this is kind of one element of their business. Let's store this in green here. So Twitter, the company, runs the application that interacts with Twitter's database, which is at a very high level overview, the other part of Twitter. So we can say Twitter database. Between the application or applications such as twitter.com, the Twitter mobile app for iOS and the Twitter mobile app for Android, these are just pulling data from and to the Twitter application. That's a very high level overview of how any Web2 application works. And within this, you have authentication between the client and the server, which interacts with the database. You'll have services alongside the database. You'll have services between the database and the application, such as an API, to give the user a more powerful and fluent user experience. But at a very high level overview, this is all that Twitter really does. You have an application, that reads data, shows posts to you, and writes data, which is the creation of posts, to the database. That data is only accessible by Twitter, the company. The same can be said about any social media platform. Facebook has facebook.com, the application, the Facebook apps, which read and write data to their database. And these companies cannot interact with one another's database. Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have access to Twitter's database to pull in information into Facebook and vice versa. Facebook 
doesn't share data with the Twitter application. These are their own siloed ecosystems that build and own both the application and the data that is displayed and written to in that application. When you think about what data is actually stored in a social media database, it's all kind of the same no matter what platform you're building. For example, Twitter, you create a Twitter profile, you read other people's posts by following those users, and you can also create content by tweeting. You can comment on other people's posts, you can like other people's posts. That's pretty much the end of the Twitter ecosystem. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but the general flow of signing up, creating a profile, following other people, creating content, reading content and interacting with content is the exact same across all social media platforms. For example, on Facebook, you create a profile, create a post, read other people's posts, interact with other people's posts. It's just the little nuances that are different between most social media platforms. Obviously, there's exceptions with some social media platforms having unique features to that platform, but the general create a profile, follow up other people, read and write data to that database is the exact same for every social media platform. When you think about what data is actually being stored in these social media platforms, it's in the form of a graph. And a graph is a data structure that represents relationships between different entities. So for example, I have a Facebook account. So here's me, my, well, let's just say me. I'm friends with my girlfriend on Facebook, right? So there's a relationship between me and my girlfriend. My girlfriend also has friends. So let's say she has three friends on Facebook. So you can say friend one, and we'll copy and paste this. Friend one becomes friend two over here. Friend two, paste that, and friend three. So my girlfriend, for example, has three friends and that's represented in this kind of graphical relationship from my girlfriend to friend one, to friend two, and to friend three. Friend three might also be friends with friend two. I might also be friends with friend two. I might also be friends with friend one. This is a graph and it's an excellent way to represent the relationships between people in social media platforms. Because when you think about it, there's no real starting point to this data structure. You could start from friend one and friend one is friends with me and my girlfriend. She's not friends with friend two, whereas friend two is friends with friend three and friends with my girlfriend. There's no real starting point to this information. And that's useful for building social media applications because you could go and see my Facebook profile and see who I'm friends with. There's no reason to pull information about who friend three is friends with when you're on my profile. That is a very basic overview of what a graph is and what data is being stored inside of most social media platforms database. This is linked to content that you can create. So I would have post one. This is written by me and associated to my profile. My girlfriend can interact with post one, friend one can interact with post one, but this relationship is created by me and other people interact with that. The point I'm trying to make here is every kind of social media platform has the same data and has these siloed ecosystems where one company, whoops, one company owns this entire ecosystem. Recent events on Twitter have kind of raised the issues of a company owning the underlying data layer. In my personal opinion, it's okay for a application to be owned by a company, but the data should be owned by the users. That's what Web3 is about, and that's what Lens Protocol is an excellent example of. Recently, Twitter decided certain content wasn't going to be allowed on Twitter. If you posted that kind of content, such as linking out to other social media platforms, you would be banned from Twitter and your social graph is completely gone. It's like you never existed, you lose 100% of your social graph, you lose your followers, and you also lose all of your content because an external party, the owner of that data, decided that it didn't belong on the website anymore. 
And the example that I'm talking about here is Paul Graham, who posted a link to his Mastodon account and had his entire profile nuked from Twitter and banned from the platform. That's just an example of why Lens exists and what the existing problems of Web2 social media platforms are today. I don't personally think that Lens is going to completely replace Twitter and Facebook, and Instagram and TikTok. It's just an alternative kind of way of thinking and way of building platforms parallel to the Web2 ecosystem. In Web3, as I'll show you here, it's about owning the data. The database is separate from the company. Facebook doesn't own Facebook's database, for example, in a Web3 world. And that's exactly what Lens Protocol and the broader Web3 ecosystem is generally about. We have a layer, which is the blockchain. And above that, we have the Lens Protocol. So the Lens Protocol is a series of smart contracts deployed to the blockchain. So these will represent smart contracts. We'll add Lens Protocol here. And the Lens Protocol deploys smart contracts that live on the Polygon blockchain, which is just a kind of layer two to the Ethereum blockchain. There might be people that disagree with me about that and there's nuances about that, but in general, it's an alternative to Ethereum. And these smart contracts get stored directly on the blockchain. The applications that are built on top of Lens Protocol are completely separate to the data itself. So you can have app one owned by Jared, you can have app two completely separate by somebody I have no idea who is, and you can say this is created by Nada. And both of these are pulling information from the blockchain, which actually goes through the Lens Protocol smart contracts to their applications. The difference here is there's no bigger box around all of these applications. There's no company that owns both data and application. There's actually no company that even owns the data. It's all just stored on the blockchain, which as you know, is permissionless, it's decentralized, and no one party has full control over the data that's stored on the blockchain. What this means is I create a profile on to Lens Protocol, which means I'm creating a token onto the blockchain directly. That token stores information about my profile, such as my name and my handle on the Lens Protocol. What this means is I own that piece of data which is stored on the blockchain. So let's say this orange box here represents my profile. I am the owner of this profile. That information is stored on the blockchain. My wallet owns this piece of data. Facebook, for example, would be the equivalent of owning this piece of data, all right? Facebook owns your social media profile. Facebook also owns all of your posts. And the difference here is it's a different way of structuring ownership of the data layer for an application because the application is still owned by somebody, but the applications are really just an interface for reading and writing data to the underlying data layer, which is stored on the blockchain and owned by the creators of those profiles and posts and comments and anything that you store through the Lens Protocol or through Web3 in general is owned by the creator rather than the company who created that application. Okay, so hopefully I've made this clear that Lens Protocol is really a set of code that lives on the blockchain that stores social media data, such as profiles and posts, onto the blockchain. That content and that data is owned by the people who created it rather than a company. This format allows this data to be opened up to anybody to build on. So you could build an application on top of this, Nada can build an application on top of this, I can build an application on top of this, whereas Zuckerberg can't build an application on top of Twitter's database. And those are the kind of two key differences. One is data ownership, and two is anybody has access 
to build on top of the data in the social graph provided by Lens. And this isn't just Lens. Lens is a perfect example of this, but this is what Web3 accomplishes in general. It's a way of owning data and having that data accessible across applications which act as interfaces to read and write data to the blockchain. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual Lens protocol layer here in our diagram. What really is Lens? It's just a series or a set of smart contracts deployed to the blockchain. A smart contract is really just code that's written and callable in specific ways to run logic, to read and write data from the blockchain. You can actually explore all of the source code of the Lens protocol on the documentation here in the deployed contract addresses section. Uh, it's a little bit scary and I'd recommend you have a look around at sort of how these smart contracts are written and what aspects there are to them. But I'll give you a quick overview of my understanding here as well. So the really core element of Lens is the Lens Profile NFT collection, which is available here. You can see it on OpenSea, for example. So it's called Lens Protocol NFTs, or sorry, Lens Protocol Profiles. It has around 100,000 items or NFTs slash profiles minted so far. And an NFT is really just a way of storing data on the blockchain in a specific format. The Lens Protocol Profiles store information about the profile, such as my handle, it stores an image, which is an SVG, just rendering my handle, I believe. I'm not 100% sure or not or how this graphic is generated. I believe it is an SVG, which is stored on chain to actually just store an image that contains my lens username and a nice little graphic here. What's more important though, is the lens profile smart contract has information about what posts you've stored onto your profile. The posts themselves are not actually tokens at the time you create them. So if we go back to our diagram, let's add a top heading here. Let's make everything look nice light green. Let's say lens, how it works. And let's make it a little bigger. So really you have this core kind of lens profile NFT collection. And what's so special about these NFTs is they store information about what posts you've created in the Lens Protocol ecosystem. So it stores what posts you've made. And what I mean by this is the posts themselves are not tokens. When you create a post, that content, for example, let's say I made a tweet saying, hello world, the content of that tweet goes into a storage provider such as IPFS or Arweave, or I believe even centralized storage solutions. It's not directly stored on chain. The text hello world doesn't hit the blockchain at any point. It goes to a storage provider. A link to that content is generated such as um, jaredwatts.com slash hello world. And let's pretend that link says hello world and returns that in an object. That link is stored on the blockchain. So this here is actually just a mapping of links and says who made that post. It's a little more complicated than that in the actual Solidity smart contract code, but you can just imagine that each profile stores what posts have been made by this person. And the post itself is actually just a link. So each profile has a set of links which represent the post's content. So for example, if I wanted to see all of my posts, I would get back a list of links that stores the actual content. That's what's stored on the actual blockchain inside of the Lens Profile NFT collection. So we've covered the kind of two core aspects of social media profiles is profile and posts or publications as they're called in Lens. And typically you would have other information stored in your ecosystem, such as likes and comments, reposts or shares, follows and things like that. So if you want to go into depth about the major concepts of Lens, I would definitely recommend you read this major concepts section, but we've discussed the profile NFTs. The profile NFT stores the publications. Comments are publications or posts themselves that reference 
another publication. So you're actually making another, an, sorry, you're making a new post every time you comment and that comment just has a kind of special property that says this is related to another publication. A mirror is basically the equivalent to a retweet. The only difference is the mirror is a post that doesn't have a content URI field or it doesn't have that link that stores the actual content. It just points to the original posts link because there's nothing new being created. So publication and comment and mirror are all very similar with tiny kind of differences between um, what content it's being pointed to and what kind of special elements it has. Collect is where, in my opinion, it gets super interesting. Collect is a way of tokenizing or minting content that got created as a publication into an NFT. So you can choose to collect a post that someone made and mint that into an NFT. And you might be saying, why on earth would I want to do that? And this is where modules come into the Lens protocol. You can define any set of code that adheres to a sort of set of interfaces that defines what happens or what criteria needs to be met in order for someone to collect or mint your post. So you can also say what um, rules there are about collecting your posts. You might have to pay uh, one ether or something like that to collect a post and mint it as an NFT. You might say there's only 10 in supply of this post available to be collected. What's really interesting about Lens is you are completely free to create these modules that define the rules of who and how users can collect your posts as NFTs. This introduces a kind of element of scarcity and revenue, which is really empowered by the blockchain with its native tokenized systems to send cryptocurrencies between two wallets. And you can dive into all of the available collect modules that exist, but a really good one is, for example, you want to pay to mint this into an NFT. So let's say I made a post, I'm gonna say, hey, this is my post, I'm releasing 10 of these, you can pay me 10 bucks to mint this if you want to, right? And that might sound stupid with the example I gave, but it depends on what value that post represents. You can then use those NFTs, for example, in other areas of the world. Let's say you want to restrict access to content to people who bought the post or give people who bought this post a special reward. That token represents someone who's supporting your content and collecting it by adhering to the rules that you've outlined. And you are completely free to configure and set up those rules in the Lens protocol. When you follow someone, you mint an NFT. When you collect a post, you're also minting an NFT. For example, when you follow someone, you get a NFT that looks like this, which is me following Nada on Lens. So I have Nada Lens follower NFT, which is owned by my wallet. You might say there's rules of who can follow me. So you can see here, you can attach a follow module rather than a collect module to collect posts. And this is the equivalent to say, okay, you might have to pay $1 for following me on the Lens protocol and then offer special um, access to posts based on who follows you or you could uh, hide content only to users who follow you and kind of build in uh, a Patreon or an OnlyFans kind of style uh, platform directly available on the Lens protocol itself. So these modules give so much creative freedom of who can see your posts, how they can see your posts, and build in this kind of integrated revenue streams of releasing content onto the Lens protocol. And this is completely kind of optional. You don't have to integrate any kind of payment if you don't want to. It's just kind of a built-in way to say, here's a direct way to support me on the Lens protocol and I'm still releasing this content that only people who follow me or collected some of my stuff or whatever criteria you want can perform certain actions on the content that I'm releasing. Okay, so I know we've talked about the concepts of Lens a lot, but I wanna show you one kind of super important thing before we dive into the next section. And that is actually at the bottom of the Lens documentation in general information. 
this was super surprising to me and kind of eye-opening of how Lens actually works when you're building applications on top of it. And you might be surprised to know that Lens actually maintains, or the team that built the Lens protocol, maintains a Web2 stack alongside the Web3 blockchain kind of layer. What I mean by that is the smart contracts inside of the Lens protocol on the blockchain. So let's say Polygon blockchain stores the smart contracts of Lens. All right, and here's all of our smart contracts. Just copy and paste these little boxes that represent the smart contracts deployed to the blockchain that make up the Lens protocol. In theory, you could read and write directly from the Lens protocol smart contracts. So for example, our application could say, let's read what this information about this user's profile is from the smart contracts. So we'll make a request and we'll say, here's the information about Jared Watts's um, profile. That is possible and all of that data is stored in a decentralized manner on the Polygon blockchain. What's a little more complicated is when you start to want to read relational data from smart contracts, right? Let's say, for example, I wanted to know all of the addresses that follow my profile. That is not a query that's directly available on the blockchain, right? That might require me to pull in from this contract and pull in from this contract or read the events of the history of the contracts. It's not an easy thing to do is query specific things that you would want to see in an application, right? Directly from the blockchain. So to solve this, the team that built Lens Protocol maintains what I call a Web2 stack in parallel to the blockchain. This doesn't mean that Lens is centralized. It just means when you're reading data from Lens, you interact with their internal stack, which is using Postgres, Redis, and GraphQL. Right, so as the database, let's add this header here to say Lens Web2 Stack. They have a database that stores the data in an internal system. So let's call this Postgres database. And this is just an, a SQL database if you don't know what Postgres is. The Postgres database is basically storing a copy of everything that's happening on the smart contracts on the blockchain, right? We then have a cache that sits somewhere in this Web2 stack using Redis. I personally don't know a lot about Redis, I've never used it, but it is somewhere kind of caching the results of the database. However, to interact with the data and read data, this is really important, I keep saying read, this is not for writes, this is just for reading data, you're using a GraphQL API. And the GraphQL API reads data from the Postgres database in our application, which is a separate kind of entity that we'll do in blue, Let's say application. We're going to read data. We're gonna send a request to the GraphQL API to say, hey, I want information about all of the profiles that follow me. It's then gonna send that data back in a super structured format, which we can pick and choose which fields we want to see. So let's say on that page of my application, I wanted to say, I wanna show all of the profiles who follow me's picture, name, and handle. We can request, give me P, which represents <laughs> the picture, the name, and the handle. That's the information I want. Give me that back from the database. When we write data, let's say I create a post, we're interacting directly with the smart contract. The Web2 stack is constantly listening for these events, such as creating a post, right? It says, okay, Jared just created a new post. Let's store that in our internal system. A new post has been created. Here's who created it. Here's who's liked it. Here's who's collected it. Listen for all of these events and just constantly store those in our internal systems. When you go to read the result of that write to the smart contract, you're actually reading the database. You're reading it through the GraphQL API, which you're sending requests to using just a fetch, right? You're saying, here's the data I want, get it back from the Web2 database. Again, this doesn't mean that Lens is centralized. All of the data is still available on the blockchain and you can pull directly from that if you choose to do so. 
The Web2 stack, as I'm calling it here, is just a parallel system to the decentralized Web3 system. It's constantly polling data to say, okay, here's what happened, here's what happened, here's what happened. Store those in a relational format, make it accessible to everyone through a query language that most developers might be familiar with, or if you're not, it's quite easy to learn. That is how we're going to build out our application. We read data through this centralized system, we then write data through a decentralized system. We're writing directly to the smart contracts. That's super important to me. And I think that is really important when you think about how you're building out these applications and how Lens actually works under the hood and why these decisions were made. You can read the kind of justifications in the general info section. How do we index? How do we cache? What database? What is the backend code? why GraphQL, all of these things are available in the actual documentation. This is my understanding of why it's been done and how it works. You can feel free to dive deeper than I have if you choose to do so. Okay, so with this crazy diagram on screen, let's shift focus now into how we're actually going to build an application on top of all this foundational knowledge. So if we scroll down here, let's drastically simplify this and say all of the stuff that we've talked about is our back end and let's just call that lens. All we need to do is build the front end that interacts with lens. So this is our application. Unless you need some kind of back end server side environment separate from what lens has already provided, you are really building out a front end application whenever you're building on top of lens. You don't actually need your own database, you don't need your own API, you don't need caching on the server side. All of it is handled by Lens. And we're just building the front end to interface with the Lens data layer. And that's the beauty of Web3 and the beauty of the Lens protocol. What we're going to be using for our stack is Next.js, which is a JavaScript React framework that has a ton of developer experience improvements from your typical create React app or Vite setup. It allows you to add super complex functionality like server-side rendering, static site generation, as well as a plethora of features that are available in Next.js and Vercel as well. We'll be using Vercel, which is the creator of Next.js to deploy our Next.js application. So we'll just quickly add Vercel in here as well. So this is our application. We'll be using GraphQL and a few GraphQL libraries such as GraphQL CodeGen to interact with the backend that Lens provides with their GraphQL API. So we need a way in our client to say, okay, hit that GraphQL server with our queries, with our mutations to read and write data to the Lens GraphQL API and get information back in a way that is type safe. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can set this up with the next tool that we're going to use in our stack, which is called React Query. React Query is amazing. It's probably my favorite tool that I've learned about in the past year. It just makes everything so much easier in terms of managing data inside of the front end of your application. It's a, a lot of the time a replacement for use state and use effect. Um, makes your code base so much simpler and I can't wait to show you if you haven't already used React Query or learned about React Query. It literally changed my life of how good this is and I can't wait to show you if you haven't already heard of it. The final thing that I'm gonna show you in our application is ThirdWeb. And we're using a variety of ThirdWeb's tools that they have available. We're using the UI components such as the connect wallet button, the Web3 button, which allows you to call functions on a smart contract and make sure the user is connected and on the correct network before you call those functions. And the third and final UI component that we'll use is the IPFS media renderer, which pulls data down from IPFS, such as an image or a video or an audio file, whatever is stored there gets detected, what kind of file it is and renders the relevant HTML onto the UI for you. And also puts it through the free gateway that the service provides, which is free provided by ThirdWeb. So it just makes interacting with IPFS so, so much easier and probably my favorite part of the UI components available. 
The other things we'll be using is the SDK to do things like sign messages and recover signing addresses and interact with the signatures that are required to use the Lens protocol when you're writing messages. So you'll want to sign a message when you go to create a post, you want to sign a message when you go to uh, follow someone on Lens and we'll be using the SDK to do things like that. We'll also be using the React SDK to connect to our smart contract using these type safe React hooks and call specific functions on the smart contract using the SDK. So we'll be using ThirdWeb for quite a variety of things. This is the company that I'm currently working at, so this might be biased, but I personally think ThirdWeb is the best way to interact with your smart contracts and works super, super well with Next.js and also uses React Query under the hood. So it's going to cooperate super well with our existing tech stack that we have outlined so far. Okay, so let's finally jump into actually creating some code. We're gonna be using Next.js with TypeScript as we mentioned, and you can feel free to explore the documentation of Next.js yourself if you haven't used it already. While we're creating the project, I'll show you a few of the key features that we'll be utilizing and why we're choosing Next.js in general. What you wanna do is you'll open up a command line where you wanna create your project. You'll go to documentation and in the automatic setup section, you'll find the create next app CLI. We're gonna be using TypeScript. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste this NPX create next app at latest for the latest version of the CLI and the TypeScript flag for using TypeScript over JavaScript. The first thing it's gonna ask is what do we wanna name our project? Let's just say my lens app. I do want ESLint included in the project and that's going to go ahead and install all of these dependencies for us. This is going to be using Next.js 13 uh, and React 18 at the time I'm recording this video. I will have a template, hopefully, in either GitHub or Replit in the description below. If you want to match up the versions of what I'm using in this video or you're running into any versioning errors, you can feel free to inspect the exact versions that I've used and install those in your project if you choose to do so. Once that is complete, you can change directories into that newly created project and then open that up in your text editor here. I'll quickly show you the basics of what we have with this project that we've created, just in case you're not familiar with the Next.js already. So within the pages folder, we have the API routes folder, which is responsible for handling logic for you on the server side when you deploy this project to the server, such as Vercel is what we're going to use to deploy our Next.js project. And that will create these kind of serverless functions that run logic on the server side. I know that sounds like it contradicts itself, but we're not actually going to be using this API route anyway. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete the API route folder. Within the pages folder, we have the underscore app.tsx page, which is a wrapper around our entire application. So anything we put within these brackets is going to affect every page on our application, which is bringing me to the next page, which is the index.tsx page. This is our home page, and you can see there's just essentially a bunch of HTML or JSX in this file that renders some of the introductory content of how to use Next.js. You can feel free to explore this or run it by running npm run dev or yarn dev if you have yarn installed, and that will bring up the server at localhost 3000, which will open up what your project is actually rendering when you actually kickstart the project inside of the localhost server. So you can see here, this is what we have inside of the homepage now, and you can get started by editing the index.tsx page. So if I go ahead and essentially just delete all of this and say, hello world, and you'll see that reflected in the UI here. So that is our homepage. The other page here is the document.tsx page. And to be honest, you don't really need to worry about this too much. I actually didn't know this was even included. This must be a new feature of the create next app on Next.js 13, but I don't imagine we'll be touching this file too much. You can read into any of the details of the underscore document file or the underscore app file, how the pages directory works. If you're not already familiar with the kind of patterns of what Next.js includes. As we sort of set up our project now, we're ready to introduce some of the libraries and tools that we're going to be using outlined in that tech stack diagram that we had earlier. So the first one that I wanna show you is my personal favorite library that I've probably ever discovered 
it's called React Query or TanStack Query is kind of the new name for it. I'm just gonna be using those interchangeably. What it does is makes working with data and data fetching in your React applications feel actually 10 times, I would say, better than working and making hooks by yourself using use state and use effect and managing the things like loading flags, error flags, retries, and all of these kind of complex features yourself. And it does this all out of the box for you with even more features like query invalidation, caching, deduping, refreshing that data when the user reclicks on the page or comes back to the page, all of these amazing features, and I have a blog here on sort of the basics of setting up React Query and what React Query achieves if you wanna use this blog to kind of get yourself a deeper understanding. But essentially, what it does is provides you with these hooks, and the main two hooks are use query, which fetches some data from an asynchronous function that you provide and wraps it in this hook that you can use and exposes all of these amazing variables that you can use on the UI, like an is loading flag, an error flag, an is fetching flag, and caches those results based on the sort of cache key that you provide. So for example, if you wanted to fetch information about post one, you would provide it a post one cache ID or a cache key. It fetches that data, gives you a hook that you can use, that hook contains variables such as is loading, is error, and a data when that data comes back from the function. So any errors and any loading states are all handled for you while that asynchronous function is running. That information is then cached. So whenever you use that same exact query for getting post information about post one, that is already immediately available inside of your cache. You can configure all of these features like rerunning the query when the user comes back. So make sure all of the information the user is seeing is up to date. You can use things like the uh, query invalidation. So when you change data, you can invalidate the query to make it rerun and say, okay, let's make sure we have the live most up-to-date data inside of that use query hook. So the data in your previous hook is becoming um, sort of this live effect where you're rerunning it every time you change the state in your actual database. And there's so many awesome features for this library and it's so easy to use. The best way I feel like I can demonstrate the power of TanStack Query or React Query is inside of a really common example that you would usually use inside of sort of a React application. I'm just gonna do this in JavaScript quickly so we can ignore some of the errors as we're just gonna be using some kind of demo code. So what React Query achieves is it solves probably the most common patterns that you would use in a React application when interacting with data, like using use state and use effect fetching data, waiting for data to come back to then fetch more data based on that data and updating data when you've changed data and all of these really common patterns that you have inside of most React applications. So for example, a common pattern that you would use is use state and use effect to manage fetching data inside of your React component. Let's add two kind of dummy functions within this React component here. One is for fetching a post and when that post comes back, we'll use the information from that fetch to fetch the author profile of the person that wrote that post. So let's write an async function here called fetch post. And we're just gonna pretend to write fetch from my database, the post. And we'll return a post object that looks like this. We'll say total title is my post content and we'll have an author ID field Let's just say this is author number one. And this represents the ID that we'll use to make the subsequent query for the author's profile. So we'll have an async function here called fetch author. And this is going to accept the ID and we'll make a fetch request to the database to get the author and use the ID that we passed in from the previous query. So we'll return the profile of the author. So the logic here is we'll fetch the post, pass in the author ID to the fetch author, and then return the author's profile as well. So within our React component, we'll have access to both the post and the author profile who created that post. We'll need some state to store the post itself. We'll also need some state to store the author here. 
and say set author and set post inside of use state. We'll then use a use effect block to say some kind of async logic within here. So we'll say async and fetch the data inside of here for the post. So say const post is equal to await fetch post and then set the post. We'll then usually have another async uh, block where we say, okay, every time the post change, then let's say fetch the author. So we'll say whenever the post change in the dependency array here, let's run this block to so say async, okay, await the result of getting the author from the post. So if there's no post, then we exit out. If there is a post, we fetch the author using the author ID field that got returned from this request, pass that into the fetch author function here. And then we pretend we make a fetch request to our API or our database or whatever to get information based on this unique identifier for the profile. So now we have this logic for managing the post and the author and on the kind of UI here, what we would do is we say, okay, let's say the post here, we say post dot, uh, what was that title? And we'd need a question mark here to say, okay, post might be null or undefined until we fetched it. We would then say author, and we could say within here, author question mark dot name again. So while the information is loading from these fake fetch requests we have, this is just going to show nothing on the UI. So we'd probably wanna realistically have some kind of loading state. So we'd say const loading post <laughs> and set loading post. And we would say const loading author, set loading author. We'd also wanna say, okay, if something went wrong, we want an error state. So we'd say const post error and set post error. And we'd say const author error, set auth error. When we make this request, we'll say try <laughs> and you can see where I'm going with this. This just becomes so messy when you actually have this and say, finally, the loading is false. So you'd say, try, actually do what I want, set it in state, catch, if there's an error, set the error. Otherwise, either way, set the loading to um, false, right? And you would have to do the same in here. And then you would have these kind of complex states where is loading post, is error, and all of this is just so handwritten and you're going to repeat this logic so many times throughout your components in React that it feels like there must be a way for this to be better. And this is just one example of what React Query solves and React Query just makes this so much more efficient. All you need to do in React Query is say, write your async function. So you'd have a fetch here. You would wrap it in a use query to say, okay, here's the query key that we're going to be using for the cache of this query, fetch that information, and we get is loading while that async function is running. We get error if that function returns an error or something goes wrong at any point in this function that we've defined here. And then when that data comes back, is loading becomes false, data then becomes available for you to use. So you can see already on the UI, you would have if is loading, return loading. We have not managed our own state for the loading flag for that piece of data. We haven't managed our own state for the error. And then we don't have these weird question marks when the data is actually available. We can just say, okay, this result was successful. It's available in this data field. We can safely assume at this point that async function was successful. We can then go ahead and display it on the UI without these kind of null safety checks with that question mark syntax. What you can also do is have dependent queries. So you can say only enable a query when a certain variable exists. So for our example, we could say, don't run the next query to fetch the author until the author ID is available. So we can have two use query hooks with separate statuses for the is loading flag, the error flag, and the data field. And that second query isn't going to even run until that author ID field becomes available. You can also configure how many times you want to retry the query when it fails. So if the query fails, it'll retry and say, okay, maybe something weird went wrong. We'll try it again, try it again. Okay, it didn't actually come back. Something's clearly wrong with this and return the error flag. We then introduce the concept of mutations, which instead of reading data is about writing data. 
you can configure these things called query invalidation so that when a mutation runs, let's say you change the information of post one, you can say to React Query, okay, that query that you made previously about post one is now no longer valid. You need to refetch that and get the new information and you literally write one line of code to invalidate the query that you made. You get that loop back again where it then re starts the kind of is loading flag, refetches that async function that you've defined and resets the results in that cache. So again, it's a little bit of uh, kind of background knowledge of what the tools are that we're going to be using, but I think it's super important to understand why we're picking these tools and what purpose they serve within our application. We're going to be using React Query in combination with GraphQL and the CodeGen library that we're going to show off next to create a kind of pattern that looks like this, we'll have a GraphQL query, we'll use the use query hook, we'll define a query key for that query. For example, we're getting all of the films here from some imaginary uh, films database with this GraphQL query. We then say, okay, here's the function, the async fetch request to get that data from our API. This is where we're sending the request. This is the GraphQL document, the data that we want back from that request, and we can send some options available in this uh, third parameter here too. That's going to be available in that use query with the data field, the is loading field, the error field, all of the features of React Query with the cache and invalidation and things like that. This is the general pattern that we're going to use. When you combine this React Query setup with this library called GraphQL CodeGen, you get a full end-to-end -end setup with complete type safety, where all you need to do as the developer is write the GraphQL for the query or the mutation that you want to perform onto the GraphQL server. So all you would need to do in this example is write the operation.graphql file here the schema of the full kind of GraphQL server is available on Lens. So if you go to api.lens.dev, you can view the full schema of everything that you can do within this kind of uh, playground here. You can actually perform these queries and these mutations directly within this editor as well, if you choose to do so. So we load up this full schema with all of these types and these fields available. We provide that to this GraphQL code generator. So that's that schema.graphql here. We then write operations that we wanna perform. So we would say in this example, let's write a query to find the user. And this performs the find user operation based on the data in the GraphQL schema. We then write a code gen file, and this can be uh, a configuration file written in YAML or in TypeScript or whatever you choose to do so. I'm going to be using YAML, I think it's quite clean. All you need to do is say, this generates this file with the following plugins. We get TypeScript for the type safety of the React query hooks. We get the TypeScript operations and the final one is the TypeScript React query. So you can see if you run this um, command to generate the file, which would just be npm run code gen or npm run generate. You can completely customize whatever you choose to do so in your project. This is the result, this fourth file here. And it generates all of the available types that are based on the schema that you provide. And then down the bottom here, it generates actual type safe React query hooks and mutations that reflect the operations that you want to make inside of the GraphQL files that you've defined. So as you can see here, we have a find user GraphQL operation. We run the generation. We then get this use find user query has these types generated for us. So it's all completely type safe, has these variables available, which is another type that gets generated and actually writes the use query hook inside of React query code generates a cache key for you and performs that fetch on the GraphQL server based on the function that you define up the top here. So this is the actual function that performs the fetch against the GraphQL server, sends the query that you're running, runs that code on the server, wraps it in a React query, use query hook or use mutation hook, and all of this is completely type safe and completely automatically generated for you. So when you combine these two libraries, you get this 
awesome, awesome user experience. This is probably my favorite setup that I've ever used where you literally just write GraphQL, run the command and you have type safe end-to-end -end queries and mutations from the GraphQL server that you're running, which in our case is just this api.lens.dev. So we get these React query hooks and mutations generated for us and we send them behind the scenes. All of this codes get generated to say, let's send these queries and send these mutations to Lens, get the data back in this really easy to use way with all of these benefits of the React query library. So let's go ahead and install all of the dependencies required for React Query and for the GraphQL code generator uh, libraries inside of our project now. So to do that, we can go to the installation of Tanstack Query. Let's go ahead and add this into our project. So say yarn add at Tanstack slash React Query. We'll then go to the installation page of GraphQL code gen. We'll add GraphQL. And that's for the dependencies. We'll also need to add some dev dependencies for the GraphQL code gen CLI and the kind of plugins that we've configured inside of this code gen configuration file here as well. Cool, so the dependencies are done. Now we just need to add some dev dependencies that we're going to use to actually generate the generated file for us uh, using the CLI library here. So we're gonna say yarn add the GraphQL code gen slash CLI. And if you remember in this configuration file, we have a couple of plugins. We're gonna be using the TypeScript plugin. We're gonna be using TypeScript operations, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll also need to install these libraries as well. So we're gonna add at GraphQL dash code gen slash TypeScript. We'll say at GraphQL dash code gen slash TypeScript operations. We'll say at GraphQL dash code gen. And then we'll say TypeScript react query. We'll say at GraphQL dash code gen, and we're gonna add one more called fragment matcher. And as we start to write out the configuration file, we'll explain why we're installing all of these dependencies. But the main one that you care about here is the actual CLI, which we're going to add and utilize as a command for us to uh, create and generate this auto-generated file in the uh, end result here. So we'll accept the schema and the operations that we define. We we'll write this code gen YML or YAML file, and this will be the result when we actually run the code gen CLI. Cool, so it looks like all of those dependencies are installed. Again, if you want, you can look at the source code for all of the versions of the dependencies that I've installed inside of the package.json file, the dependencies here and all of the de dev dependencies that we've installed for the GraphQL code gen CLI. So if anything looks different and isn't working because of versions, please check out the package.json file. Just make sure you're not on a different major version uh, than I am if you're watching this video in the future. Now that we have everything available inside of our project and installed, we can kind of actually just follow the four steps for setting up the process here. So the first box here, or the schema.graphql file, is the GraphQL schema. And as I showed you before, this is actually just Lens API Playground. Uh, what is the, there it is, the api.lens.dev. So our schema isn't a file, it's actually a URL. So we're going to change that setup a little bit. And we're just gonna say point to this schema available at this URL. And that will read the full uh, schema available on this api.lens.dev. So we can kind of ignore this first file here. We don't need to create that. We're going to use a URL rather than a file. We then can define the operations that we want to perform onto the uh, GraphQL server. So we'll define things like create posts or get posts or get profile onto the Lens API in these .graphql files. And I'll show you an awesome repository built by the Lens team that pretty much contains every GraphQL query and mutation you could possibly use on the Lens API. So we also kind of won't be writing these ourselves. We'll be copy and pasting these from a repository provided by Lens. So then that leads us to the third file here, which is the codegen.yml file. Now this is the configuration file that gets used when we go to run the code gen command, which is going to output this fourth file here. So within our project, let's go ahead and create that file called codegen.yml. And while we're here, I'll create a source folder and move both the pages and the styles directories into that source folder. 
So now everything we're kind of editing is in the source folder and outside of that folder is more configuration files. Within this code gen configuration file, we need to define a few things. So the first thing we need to define is the schema. The second thing is the documents, which is the second thing here. What operations do we actually wanna generate React query hooks and mutations for? So when we define the documents, this is what path are the GraphQL operations located at. The schema is where is the GraphQL schema located? And the first thing we can do here is we can say the schema is pointed at this API slash lens slash dev URL. So we're gonna say API, um, sorry, I think it needs the HTTPS. Whoops, sorry about that. It needs the API slash lens slash dev. So let's copy and paste this URL into our schema here. That is where our GraphQL schema is located. So if you go to this URL, this effectively links you to where this GraphQL schema is. So it's going to pull in this full GraphQL schema and read that and accept that as our first file in these kind of three setup steps that we have here. The second thing we need is to actually define the operations that we want to perform onto that GraphQL schema. And where I located all of these is the Lens API examples repository. So we just Google this and the first repository should show up. You can go into the source folder here and you'll find all of the GraphQL queries available, such as the, where is it here? Uh, should be a GraphQL folder, here we go. So the GraphQL. And what this does is provides you with a vast array of GraphQL queries and mutations for basically everything you could possibly imagine that you would wanna do on the Lens protocol. So you could literally just copy and paste this into your project, you will clone it and just copy and paste these GraphQL files. I've been a bit more selective and just say, okay, I'm only gonna copy and paste the ones that I'm going to use in the project. So. What you'll wanna do is you'll grab the common.graphql file, which has a few useful fragments for things like selecting information on a user profile or on media, basically filters down the results to only properties that you would pro most likely be interested in. So for example, on the profile fields, it's gonna select the profile ID, the profile name, the profile bio, the attributes is followed by me and selects all of the kind of quote unquote useful information out of what's available on the profile. So it's just a fragment, a part of what's available and filtering down the fields that get returned. So you can completely customize this to what fields you want, but it's just a set of helpful kind of fragments that you can use in your project. So let's go ahead and copy this into our project in our GraphQL folder that we're going to create inside of the source folder here. Let's go ahead and create that file called common.graphql. Let's paste the contents of that common.graphql file into that file. And then we can go back to the GraphQL folder and select what queries and mutations we're interested in. So for example, a basic query might be to explore the publications available on Lens. And this grants you a very simple query that uses some of the fragments such as the post fragment, the comment fragment, the mirror fragment, on the top publications that are available in the Lens Protocol ecosystem. So what we can do again is we can just say, okay, I'm interested in this explore publications GraphQL query. I'm gonna copy the contents of that file. I'm going to then create a file called explore publications.graphql and paste the contents of that file into that query here. So that is our second step we just need to define where are these documents located at now. And if you take a look at our file structure, they're located at source slash GraphQL. So let's write a comment and say, our documents are located at slash source slash GraphQL. And hopefully uh, Copilot helps us out here is what I was aiming for. So here we have, uh, it looks a little wrong. The path to our documents are slash source slash GraphQL, which is the second directory here, and then any file that ends with the dot GraphQL. So this is going to capture all of the files within this GraphQL directory and use those as sort of indicators of what we want to generate based on the schema as well here. So the next thing we wanna do is define which plugins that we wanna use and where the result is going to be generated. So now we're gonna say, where do we want to generate it? The output 
and what plugins do we want to include? And then what optional configuration flags, flags do we want to include? So this is going to come under the generates and we're going to generate the output file to slash source slash GraphQL slash generated dot TS. And for this generation, we're going to define some plugins. We're going to also define some config. The plugins are the dependencies that we installed when we ran that yarn add dev dependencies command here. So we're going to use the fragment matcher, the TypeScript, TypeScript operations, TypeScript react query plugins. So we can actually just copy and paste these into the configuration file here. So in our code gen, let's say we want uh, number one is called TypeScript. TypeScript, the second one is what we cop copied from that package JSON file. So TypeScript operations, we want to have um, TypeScript React query, which is going to generate the React hooks for us. And then we also want the fragment matcher. And this is just something that I bumped into when the output was generating some duplicate fragments. And within the config, we can then define, we just wanna dedupe those fragments if there is any duplicates so that we can actually compile the file here. So what we've defined is some plugins for what we're generating with this GraphQL code gen CLI command here. And what we can do then is actually run the CLI. So we've got all of the config required to actually generate the output file in this source slash GraphQL slash generated.ts. All we need to do now is actually run the command to get that output. To do that, you can create a script in your package.json file. Let's call it code gen. And as Copilot is suggesting here, we can say GraphQL code gen, and you can pass in the config file. I actually don't believe that's even required. And then what we can do is open up the terminal. If I zoom out one here, we can run the yarn code gen or NPM run code gen, whatever you're using. And that's going to read our schema. It's going to locate our GraphQL queries and mutations, and it's going to spit out the output file that we have here at generated.ts. So you can see within here, this is the default fetch that is going to send the GraphQL queries and the GraphQL mutations that we write to the Lens GraphQL server in our case. And it's going to return the JSON data. Otherwise it's going to return errors if the request was unsuccessful. So that's what this fetcher file here is, or the fetcher function rather. It accepts a TypeScript generic for what it's going to return as the data and what it accepts as variables and then returns a promise of that type of data. So you pass in the type of data that you're going to return, what, what variables you're going to accept, and then you can see it's literally just performing a fetch to the endpoint, which in our case is the lens slash, sorry, api.lens.dev. It's gonna perform the fetch there, perform a post request with any of the configuration that you specify in the body of that request. It then generates all of the types that are required to make all of the React hooks type safe. So you can kind of scroll past all of this and scroll very down to the bottom here, which is where our use, uh, use query and use mutation hooks are going to be generated. So you can see we added the use um, explore publications query, sorry, explore publications.graphql. This query is called explore publications. We then get the use explore publications query generated for us with the types of what is going to be returned and the types of what variables need to pass in to actually perform this request against the GraphQL server at the lens HTTPS, lens API dev, whatever it is. It's then wrapped in the use query, has its own key based on the variables that you pass in with the name of the query and uses the fetch function at the top of the file as the async kind of fetch function that it's going to be wrapping inside of that use query hook that gets generated for us. So this looks a little scary with all of the big long names <laughs> that get generated for us, but really all it means is in a React component now, we can say const is equal to use explore publications query. And within this, we can then get data, we can get is loading, we can get error. And what the amazing part about this is the data is actually typed. So you can say data 
dot explore publications dot items and you can grab the first item of that you can get the id of the publication you get the metadata of the publication within this there'll be type data about what result is being returned from that async function which itself is a graphql query against the lens api this is a lot of layers of abstraction, but what this allows us to do is have this amazing user experience powered by React Query and have all of the benefits of TypeScript and GraphQL and utilizing the schema that's already available to us to have full end-to-end -end type safety from the Lens API to our client here. So as you can see with TypeScript, it's complaining that we haven't specified what the request actually is. So if you open up these brackets, you can see the endpoint is what it's asking us to do. And we'll be using the same endpoint uh, as we defined in here. And we'll set this up with our own custom fetch functions. So we don't have to do this every time in the next step. The fetch params are going to be whatever you wanna send along with this request here. So the next kind of uh, object that you can pass is the actual request that gets sent to the API. And again, we're going to modify this a little bit so we don't have to specify the endpoint, the fetch params, everything like that. But all we need to do is pass the actual request. So you can see here is where the type safety comes in of what we're sending to the Lens API. So for the explore publications, you can provide a sort criteria of what um, publications you want to receive. So if you want to see the publications with the most likes, you can do that. You can do publications with the most comments, the most mirrors, the latest posts, curated profiles, and you can pass that to the request. So let's say I want to get the publications with the most uh, collections and we can pass that into the request itself. Now, I believe this will be uh, one last step before we can actually get this to work is to wrap our application in the provider here. So let's run this at localhost and we should see most likely an error to say you need to wrap your application in the uh, use query client provider. So if we go to the React query documentation, we'll see in the getting started here, wrong one, sorry, 10 stack query docs, should see in the installation or the quick start, we'll need to wrap our application in the query client provider, which we can do inside of the underscore app.tsx page here. So within this, we're going to say, let's wrap our entire application inside of the query client provider that is imported from the uh, React query library. So we'll first need to define the query client. So we'll create a new client and we'll import all of this from the Tanstack React query. We won't need use mutation, use query, use query client. Don't believe that's all we need to do. We just need to define the client and wrap our application in it so that we can use the hooks that it provides. So if we go back to localhost 3000 now, what we should see in the console is our object that's being printed out in, uh, in a, API slash lens slash dev 500 response. Um, post body missing, did you forget to use body parser middleware? So I believe this is just because we need to specify the type of information we're getting. Uh, so if we go to our index page, we should be able to specify in the fetch params inside of the headers, maybe let's ask Copilot here, uh, return application slash JSON. And this will be in the headers. Content type is application JSON. So as I said, we'll rewrite the kind of logic that's being generated. So we'll point to our own function rather than what gets automatically generated here. So we won't need to do this, but just to show you what we've done so far, we will add this little temporary flag here and we'll give it a refresh and we get a 400 response this time. Okay. <laughs> can only be one fragment named media fields. Okay, so this is where our dedupe fragments should be coming into play. And it doesn't look like it is. So it's saying it should only be one fragment called profile fields. And what are we doing wrong here? Let's see our little config. We have dedupe fragments is true in our generated YML file. 
So dedupe fragments is true here. And I believe we just had the um, dash in front of it. Looks like I'm just cheating a little bit off screen. So we don't need the dash in the YML file. So let's quickly regenerate the code. So let's say uh, npm run code gen, and that will regenerate our file. And this time the fragments should be deduplicated. So we won't run into this issue, hopefully. So let's open this up again. Let's clear the console here, refresh it. And there we go. Okay, so all of the configuration is set up. Now we get the is loading is true, is loading is true, is loading becomes false when the data comes back. And within that data, we have completely type safe information about the posts with the most uh, collections on the lens protocol. And within this, you can see all of the information such as the metadata of the post, such as the content, the description, the name of the post, the profile who created this post, if you follow that profile, the information about that profile. And you can literally specify anything you want inside of this explorepublications.graphql file here. And you can see this is the um, items or the properties that come back that we're selecting based on the fragments that we defined inside of the common.graphql file here. As you can imagine, this is not really necessary to specify uh, unique values in this first object here for each of the queries that we're going to be using for our lens uh, React query hooks. So what you can actually do within the codegen YML file is specify your own function that gets used as the fetcher function at the top of the generated file here. So this function is what gets called every time you make a request to read or write information to the Lens GraphQL API. You can see it's actually literally just making a post request with information, uh, which is usually for us going to be a GraphQL query or a GraphQL mutation inside of the body here. And we can abstract this away so that we don't need to specify the endpoint. We don't need to specify the fetch params. And we're also going to include a way of sending authorizations included in the headers here. And we're going to use an authorization header when the user signs in with their lens profile to say, okay, we'll send this authorization header to endpoints that require authorization, such as creating content or creating a post or modifying content, or even some queries that require a profile information, such as getting the feed for a profile, right? You need to send the authorization header to say, okay, who is this person? What is the feed for that profile? Or for example, when you're writing data, you need an authorization header to say, who is this person creating the content and are they authenticated to create what they're trying to do? So we're going to abstract this logic out into a new file called authfetcher.ts. And this is going to be a file at the root of the project. And I've created the file already. I've cheated a little bit as you can see, but what we're going to put within this file is what logic we want to run every time we send a request to the Lens GraphQL server. And we can use the fetcher function. This is the default fetch that gets produced as a starting point. So let's cut that out of the generated file and include it as our starting point here. And we'll say export default function fetcher. And this is what logic gets run currently every time we make a request to the GraphQL server. And the way that we configure to use this function rather than using a default function is to include inside of the config, you can add a fetcher and provide a function here. So this is what function to run. And beneath that, you can also specify if it's a React hook or not. In our case, it's going to be false. So we say is React hook is equal to false. So the function here is a relative path to the auth fetcher, fetcher function. So the file auth fetcher and the function within that file called fetcher, fetcher. It's a mouthful, but what we need to specify here is where is that function located? And that's just a relative path from this file here. So that's an important note. What I'm going to do just to make it super simple is I'm gonna move the auth fetcher file into the GraphQL folder. And then that way our relative path is super simple. We'll just say dot slash auth fetcher. 
and then to specify which function we want within the auth fetcher file, we can use a hashtag symbol to separate file name from function name. So the function name is just fetcher here. So now we have the relative path to the file and the name of the function within that file that we want to use every time we make one of these requests. So let's close this file and we'll use the npm run code gen command to regenerate this. And what I'll show you is in the output, in the generated.ts file, at the very top of the file, should now see we're importing a function called fetcher rather than defining the fetcher function directly within this file. So we're not using the default fetcher that gets output by uh, the default configuration here. We're specifying our own function, which you can see links to this auth fetcher, fetcher function here and that's being imported and used throughout this file here instead of the default. Since we've changed from the default value, we'll notice now this has some errors saying we have too many arguments provided or not enough arguments provided to the function that we defined as our fetcher. So if we go back to our fetcher function, we can actually get rid of the endpoint and we are going to use the same endpoint variable for all of our requests. So we're gonna say const endpoint is equal to the lens GraphQL server endpoint. And that is HTTPS slash API.lens.dev, I believe it was. Let's just double check in the browser here, playground. So that is api.lens.dev, api.lens.dev, that looks good to me. And for the rest of the fetcher logic, I'm actually just going to copy and paste the recommended React query fetcher from the official documentation here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste this into our uh, example file here. So let's paste this in to replace our logic. And instead of this api.url file here, we'll use the endpoint variable that we defined above. So you can see now we have hard-coded the headers of content type application to JSON, and we still have the body here. What we can do is say, uh, add a quick note to say to do, let's add authentication headers here. So when we implement the sign-in with lens logic, we'll add the token within the authentication header here so that we can make authenticated requests every time we call the fetch data function. And this just needs to be called fetcher instead of fetch data. And that looks good to me. So let's clean it up a little bit and maybe let's just get rid of the variable. I don't really need it. Just hard code it in here. And that looks good to me. So now, Let's rerun the npm run code gen command again. And finally, our generated file should be happy with us and we can change the way that we call these hooks that get generated. So now use explore publications query looks happy. This file is all green. In our index.tsx page, we don't need that first object anymore. You can see the object that we pass in is just the request. And here is a way you can pass in the criteria of your query itself rather than specifying the endpoint and the headers and all of the information about the request itself. So now if we do this and we go top mirrored, for example, check this out at localhost 3000, we should see in the console here, you can see again, the loading, uh, we'll try again here, the loading is true, data comes back and the explore publications is now here. So now, We've essentially got our full setup for making requests to the Lens GraphQL API, transforming those into React queries. The flow now is every time you write a GraphQL query or mutation within this file, which you can grab from the official Lens API examples repository, you then just need to run npm run code gen. All of the steps in between are completed for you. You get this end-to-end -end flow of having React query hooks generated for you and all you need to do is specify the request information itself if any of it is required. Now that we have the ability to read any information from the Lens protocol just by writing the GraphQL query and having the React hooks automatically generated for us with the configuration that we've set up so far, we're ready to add interactivity into our application. We want to allow users to connect to their wallets, sign in with Lens and start creating content and writing data back to the Lens protocol 
through the smart contracts deployed on the blockchain. This pattern is something that's not just specific to Lens, it's something that you're going to use for every Web3 application. And I wanted to show you a quick kind of overview of Web3 apps and how you should be thinking about them, and then where ThirdWeb fits into the picture, why we're using some of the available solutions to meet the needs of our application. So when you have a web application built on the blockchain, there's many parts that you're always going to use. You're going to use the blockchain. So the blockchain, on the blockchain, you've deployed some smart contracts or somebody else has deployed smart contracts. In our case, we're using Lens deployed smart contracts. So we have several smart contracts that we're going to interact with on the blockchain. You might also have an indexing solution as we've discussed earlier in this video. And there's a variety of indexing solutions and APIs to get the results of those indexing solutions, such as Alchemy, Covalent, and Morales, for example, provide APIs that you can get the results of their indexing solution of the blockchain, as well as smart contracts in general. There is also a decentralized solution called The Graph, which I don't personally know a lot about. Maybe we can make a separate video about that. But the point is you might also have an optional indexing solution if you actually require that. Sometimes, and a lot of the time, actually, you won't even need your own indexing solution to create a full stack Web3 application. To read and write data from the blockchain, you need to interact with a node. So you need a service that is running a node and that is reading and writing data directly to the blockchain. And between the node and the blockchain is where requests are being sent and requests are coming back, but our application is the one actually making these requests. So in purple here, we're gonna say application. And our application has a few requirements to add interactivity to um, our web application or our mobile application, whatever kind of product that you're building on top of the smart contracts, it needs to have some level of interactivity. It needs a few requirements. So one is say connect user wallets. It needs to read slash write information from user wallets. So this includes things like wallet balance, um, wallet address, network, things like that. You also need to request user to sign transactions and messages. And you also sometimes need to read information from the smart contracts itself. So read and write transactions from the smart contracts and the blockchain directly sometimes. And this is kind of the three requirements I would say for a very bare bones interactive web application or mobile application, whatever you're building on top of the smart contracts that you've deployed on the blockchain. So this application needs to go through the node to make these requests to read and write data. And that information is coming back to our application. So we're making requests, goes through the node, which is the service provider that says, here's the information sent to the blockchain, here's the information that comes back from the blockchain, then gets sent back to our application through this node provider. You then also have this concept of decentralized storage, such as IPFS. So let's put that in a nice orange color over here. So you have decentralized storage providers that are off-chain. So let's say off-chain storage. And this is things like IPFS, it's things like Arweave, any decentralized service provider that is kind of in this backend world and not the application world that you're reading data from. So this also needs to go through a gateway to actually render that data on an application. So this needs to go through a gateway. And that's an IPFS gateway that essentially pulls the information from IPFS and makes it available for you to view. So this goes through the gateway and into your application. So when it comes to actually building out the parts of this diagram, there is a number of tools available for you to use and you can combine those together to build out the application, which if you're familiar with Web3 Spaced, is probably what you're doing already. And building smart contracts, there's tools such as Open Zeppelin, which comes with pre-built Solidity smart contracts that you can kind of implement and override with any custom logic that you choose. You can use a framework such as Hardhat or Forge to test and deploy your smart contracts to uh, the blockchain of your choice, such as Polygon or Ethereum. 
when you're interacting with the blockchain, you'll need a node provider such as Coinbase Cloud, you can use Coinbase Cloud Node, which has a very generous free tier here with 120 daily requests. You could use Alchemy, which provides the Alchemy Super Node. It also provides the SDK, which is a solution to the indexing problem down here, which pulls a lot of information from the blockchain itself, which allows you to use their SDK to do things like get token balances, you could also do things like get NFTs for owner and wallet information, pretty much any information that has been indexed by a company that is readily available to you without, um, which wouldn't regularly be available if you were to do this yourself. When it comes to the off-chain storage and the gateway, you can use things like Pinata, which uploads your data to IPFS and pins it for you so you don't ever lose it on IPFS. You can then use uh, a gateway such as any of these public gateways to pull that information from IPFS into your applications. From an application standpoint, you might be familiar with tools like Rainbow Kit to connect your wallet and Wagme for using React hooks to read and write uh, data from the connected wallet in React and read and write data from your smart contracts as well. I'm gonna show you how we'll use ThirdWeb and ThirdWeb suite of tools to accomplish all of the steps that we need to build out our full stack Web3 app in this project. I wanna make a quick note that you can use the web with all of the tools that we've just outlined and you can treat the third web suite of tools as the kind of baseline foundational default for all of the steps of the stack. And if you prefer to use any of these tools, you can combine third web with any web three tool. It's designed to kind of be plug and playable with all of the tools in the ecosystem. For the blockchain stack here, I'm just going to remove these from our diagram. We do have solutions available for you to deploy and create Solidity smart contracts inside of either a code environment or a no code environment using the explore page. And we already have the Lens smart contracts deployed to the blockchain. So we don't need the tools for building or deploying smart contracts in this particular build. When we look at the off-chain storage solutions, we're going to use the web storage, which is a way of uploading and downloading media or any kind of files from the decentralized storage solutions that are available, such as IPFS, and we're working on adding Arweave in the very near future. For the RPC, we're going to use the default RPC provided by the ThirdWeb SDK, so we don't need to set up any third-party solution. You can choose to use any solutions such as the Coinbase Cloud node or the Alchemy Super node if you choose to do so and plug and play those into the ThirdWeb SDK. But for us, we're just going to use the default RPC slash node provided for us. In this case, we're also going to use the default um, IPFS gateway provided by the ThirdWeb SDK. So we don't really need to worry about setting up this middle layer that kind of converts the Web3 to the Web2 world. That's all just provided by default by the SDKs that we're going to be using. So we're going to be using the React SDK and the TypeScript SDK. The React SDK includes these UI components, which we're going to use a lot throughout this build, which leads us to this remaining section over here within our applications. So we're going to use UI components as part of those React SDK to connect to users' wallets, make sure they're on the right network and do things like read information about their wallet, display their balances and things like that. Once they are connected, we'll be able to easily connect to the Lens smart contracts and start writing transactions and asking the user to sign those transactions. Not only are we going to write transactions, we're going to ask them to sign messages to do things like sign in with their Lens profile and then send that data to the Lens API to get that authentication state that we're going to use to interact and write data to the smart contracts and to the Lens API. We're also going to use the ThirdWeb SDK and UI components such as the connect wallet button here, sorry, the Web3 button here, which is going to allow us to call functions directly on the Lens Protocol smart contracts when we wanna do things like follow users or create a post, we're going to be interacting with the smart contract directly. And this just makes sure we're on the correct network and we have a wallet connected before we actually try and perform that action. 
One of the favorite things that I have about the UI components is the IPFS media renderer, which we're going to use a lot throughout this project to pull information from IPFS, such as the metadata for the posts that get created on lens, the images, the videos, the audio files, all pulled in from IPFS. This component detects what kind of file is detected at a specific IPFS URL and renders the relevant HTML depending on what kind of file it is. So if it's a video, it renders a video. If it's an image, it renders an image. If it's an MP3 file, it renders a playable audio kind of snippet onto the UI for you. So a lot of the complex logic of converting the Web3 world to the Web2 world is automatically handled by Third Web. And again, if you choose to prefer any of these tools that you're more comfortable with, you can easily plug and play those into the Third Web SDK to work alongside it as well. So we'll jump into the ThirdWeb documentation at portal.thirdweb.com and we'll go to the EVM SDK and we'll install the required dependencies for front-end applications here. So we'll go yarn add the at ThirdWeb dev slash react and SDK packages as well as ethers. And then we'll jump into the storage documentation and we'll also add these dependencies here as well. So we'll say yarn add at the web dev slash react, at the web dev slash SDK, and the ethers dependency. If we go to storage, we'll also add at the web dev slash storage here as well. And we'll add these dependencies into our project, and then we'll begin writing out the flow for signing in with Lens and connecting users' wallets so that we can start to kind of add this um, interactive elements to our application. Cool, so that's installed. If we go back to the front end application setup, you can see we need to follow a similar pattern for the provider wrapping our application inside that underscore app.tsx page here. So let's go underscore app.tsx. Let's import the third web provider into our project here. Let's also declare the desired chain ID. So this is going to be what network we want users to be connected to when they're interacting with our project. For us, that's gonna be changed from Mumbai to the Polygon network since that's where the Lens smart contracts are deployed to. We're then going to wrap our application in the third web provider and that's going to go above our query client provider here. Now that we have ThirdWeb installed and ready to use, let's start to build out the sign-in flow that allows users to connect their wallet, switch to the Polygon network, and then sign in with Lens. To do that, we're going to create a new folder called components. And within this, we're going to say the sign-in button component. And we'll just put some boilerplate code in here. So within this component, what we're going to do is we're going to have some different states that the user's in, and we're going to represent that state on the UI accordingly. And the states that I'm talking about is the user hasn't connected the wallet, so user needs to connect their wallet. The user needs to switch network to Polygon. And then once they are connected and on the correct network, we can ask them to sign in with Lens. So we're gonna say sign in with Lens. And then once they have signed in, we'll show the user their profile on Lens. And the way that we're gonna use this is using a variety of hooks that are available in the SDK to accomplish the first two parts of this. We'll then move on to how the authentication flow works within Lens and implement that in its own kind of separate logic. We'll then create another hook that allows us to load the currently signed in Lens user and display their profile on the UI. So for the first section here, we're going to use a hook called use address. So this is gonna be const address is equal to use address and import that from at the web devs slash react here. We're then going to use the um, I believe it's called use network mismatch hook. And we're going to say is on wrong network is equal to use network mismatch. And this is going to detect if the user's wallet is currently connected to a network that is different to the one that we defined inside the underscore app.tsx page. So we've defined that our application is running on Polygon. If the user is connected and they're on Ethereum, this is going to be true. And we can share, show a button that says, hey, you're on the wrong network. Can you please switch networks to Polygon? 
So these are the two hooks that we're going to use to kind of detect the state. To actually trigger the switch, we're going to use a hook called use network. And we're going to say const comma switch network is equal to use switch network here. And we'll go ahead and import that from the SDK here as well. And it might just be called use, I'm not sure where my autocomplete has gone here. Use network, there we go. Just use network, not use switch network. Sorry about that, my computer's lagging a little bit here. There we go, cool. So now we have detect the connected address. We then have the ability to detect if the user is on the wrong network and a function to switch the network. To switch the network. Sweet, so in the UI, we're going to say if there's not an address, which means there's no connected wallet right now, we're gonna say return a UI component that's available as part of the ThirdWeb SDK, which is called the connect wallet button. So we're gonna say connect wallet and we're just going to close off that component. We can add some styling later, but for now we'll just close off the component. We'll then say if there's uh, if the user is on the wrong network, so if on wrong network is true, then we'll return a button that switches the user's network. So say button on click is equal to a function that calls the switch network function and sends the user to a chain ID that we specify. So we can import chain ID from the ThirdWeb SDK again and say chain ID polygon. We'll just make sure we import this from the SDK here. And we have too many brackets, it looks like. Um, close that off, there we go. Cool, so now I have a button that says switch network. When you click it, it asks you to change over to the Polygon network. Now we are at the third state where they're ready to sign in with Lens. So we're gonna say, if there isn't a user, which we don't have access to right now, we need a hook that is maybe called use lens user or use active lens user or something like that. We're going to create that next and we're going to use that state to say, okay, if there is a lens user, then we'll show the profile. If there isn't, they need to sign in with lens and trigger that flow that we're going to cover now. So the way that Lens works is you sign in with your Lens profile. And what that means is a challenge gets generated for you. You sign that challenge, send the signed challenge to the Lens API and get a access token in return, which you can use to make authenticated requests. So we'll quickly go over this in a diagram. It's kind of a three-step process. So you request a challenge from the Lens API. Your challenge then gets used to say, okay, I'm using my wallet, my wallet signs the challenge message. So this is going to prompt the actual wallet. If you're using Coinbase wallet or MetaMask, it's going to pop up and say, hey, do you really own this wallet that you're claiming to be? If you're able to sign that message, it essentially means you've proven that you own this wallet that you're claiming to be, which puts you in an authenticated state. So you can send that back to the Lens API. So you send the signed challenge back to the Lens API. If you succeed, you then get an access token. So this is the authenticated state down here. Let's do this in light green to suggest success. If you succeed, the challenge, well, it's not really a challenge. If you sign the message, you get an access token back. The challenge is really just a message. If you're able to sign the message, you prove your identity over this wallet. So you're kind of just proving that you own the wallet by signing this message. If you are able to sign it, send it back to the Lens API. That will give you an access token to make authenticated requests to the Lens GraphQL API. If you're unable to sign it, that means at some point here, you either were lying about owning this wallet and it sort of is a filter out um, to make sure that you actually own the wallet that you're claiming to be when you interact with the Lens protocol. And this is a familiar pattern with um, 
kind of any authentication flow, you need to prove your identity by either signing in with your wallet or in the Web2 world, signing in with your Google account or your email and password account, just so that you can start to make authenticated requests such as modifying the information of your account or creating content. This is a very similar flow for Web2 and Web3 as well. So inside of our code base, we then need a login flow that uh, allows for this three-step process. So we need a GraphQL query to request a challenge from the Lens API. We'll use the ThirdWeb SDK to sign the message with our wallet, and then we'll use the Lens um, GraphQL API again to send a mutation that says, hey, here's my signed message. Can you give me an access token in return? And again, we'll go back to the Lens API examples repository. And in the GraphQL folder, there will be a GraphQL query for the generation of the challenge here. So we'll say challenge.graphql, and then there should be a query or a mutation here for access token or authenticate, maybe it's called. I think it will be called authenticate here. So this looks good to me. We're going to request a challenge. So we're gonna query for a challenge from the Lens API, and that's going to give us a message that we can ask the user to sign. When they sign the message, we'll then use this authenticate mutation, send along the signed auth challenge, as it's called here. In return, we'll get this access token and a refresh token, which will be used to give us a new access token, which we can use the refresh.graphql query here. So we're gonna copy and paste these three GraphQL files into our project to kick off this authentication flow here. So let's copy and paste the challenge.graphql first into our GraphQL folder. Let's create a new file called challenge.graphql. Next, we're going to create the authenticate.graphql file. So authenticate.graphql, paste the contents of that in there. We'll paste the contents of the challenge into the challenge file. And finally, we need the refresh file as well. So we'll create another file called refresh.graphql and we'll paste the refresh mutation in here. Where the refresh comes into play is the access token that you get lasts for 30 minutes or I believe it's 30 minutes. Usually with access tokens, it has some expiration date. So alongside the access token, you get the actual token itself. You get an expiration date and you get a refresh token. So we'll store all of these in local storage. So we'll be able to use the access token. If it hasn't expired, we'll just keep using the access token. We'll use the refresh token to say, hey, the Lens API, I need a new access token pass the refresh token to that API and it returns a new access token that is valid for another 30 minutes or another however long the token survives for. So back in our code, let's create a file or a folder rather called lib. And within this, we'll create a new folder called auth. And within the auth folder, we'll create a new hook called use login.ts. We'll also create a file called generatechallenge.ts. The use login hook will represent our full authentication flow of generating a challenge, asking the user to sign it, sending that back to the GraphQL API, and then we'll store the results in local storage so that we can get that kind of refresh cycle happening to get new access tokens as well. The reason we're using the generatechallenge.ts file here rather than a hook is I just found it a bit easier to have this inside of an async function rather than use the automatically generated hook because we need to configure this to only run when the user clicks it and we don't want to use the new challenge after the user clicks it and things like that. So it's easier just to get a one-off uh, async kind of function to generate the challenge rather than use the React query out of the box for me. So with all of our new queries, let's run the npm run cogen to get all of the results into that generated.ts file. And then we'll use the result of that file to create this generate challenge function here. So let's go to the generated.ts file. And what we're gonna do is we'll take the code of the use challenge query and we'll use this fetcher code here. And what we're gonna do is just turn this into an async function rather than use the actual hook. So we're going to take this uh, code here and let's paste this into an async function here. So we're gonna say async function generate challenge 
and we'll export this function as a default. So export default async function, generate challenge for a given address. And we're going to just paste the fetcher result here and we're going to call that function. So we're gonna say fetcher and we'll go ahead and auto import all of these. This is the fetcher, challenge query, challenge query variables, challenge query document. And this is what we're expecting to come into the request. This is what we're actually sending to the GraphQL API. You can see the underlying GraphQL code here. The challenge query is what we get back as a result of making this query. The variables here is what we want to pass in. So the request will contain the user's address here. So we'll say address is equal to the address field that we pass in. So we're requesting a challenge for this specific address. If this wallet is able to sign that challenge, this must mean they own this specific wallet and they've proven their identity. So we're going to return the awaited result of this function call. And we can now see the signature of this is now a promise that returns the type of challenge query, which if you take a look at this type returns all of this kind of type name stuff. But what we're most interested in, it returns the challenge.text, which is what the user is going to sign with their wallet to prove that they own the wallet that they're claiming. Within the use login hook, there's a few steps that we need to perform here. So the first one is we want to generate a challenge, which comes from the Lens API. Before we even do that, we want to make sure the user has a connected wallet we then get the challenge back from the Lens API, sign the challenge with the user's wallet, send the signed challenge to the Lens API, which point we'll receive a access token from the Lens API if we succeed. Then we'll store the access token inside local storage so we can use it. To kick off the function, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say export default function use login. And this is gonna be a kind of two step process where we first write the actual async function. And then beneath this, what we're actually going to return is the use mutation hook from React Query wrapping the async function. And we'll talk about what that accomplishes and I will do that as we kind of uh, get to that point. But first we need to make sure the user has a connected wallet. So we're gonna say const address, it's equal to use address here, import that from the React package here. Then what we're going to do is we need to generate the challenge which comes from the Lens API. So what we're gonna do is we're going to await the generate challenge here. And what we get out of that is say const, um, I'm actually sure what comes back from this. Uh, what can we do here? Oh, we need to import generate challenge first. And then we'll say, we get the challenge back out of that function here. Now this needs to be inside of an async function. So we're gonna say async function login and we'll put that inside of here. So now we have generate challenge. It's asking us for the address. So we need to put the address as the parameter into this function. You'll now see it's complaining that it might be undefined. So if there's not a connected wallet, then we can't generate a challenge because we don't know the user's address. So to solve that, I'm just gonna say, we're assuming in this function, the user has a connected wallet and they have a uh, they're on the correct network. So before we call this use login hook, we're just gonna make sure that the user is actually connected and on the Polygon network. So going into this, let's uh, assume that they have connected and they're on the correct network when we go to call to generate challenge function. So what we'll do is we'll just say, if not address, then we'll just return. So then when we reach this line, the address must be something that is not undefined or not uh, empty value. So then we accomplish step one here. So we'll generate the actual challenge. The step two was to sign the challenge with the user's wallet. And to do that, we can go to the portal documentation here. Let's quickly close out of my work stuff. We can use the EVM SDK's wallet action section here. If we scroll down to signing a message, you'll see it's in the React SDK. We can use the use SDK hook to grab an instance of the third web SDK 
we have a message value, which is a string. And then we use the sdk.wallet.sign to just pass in that message, which is going to prompt the user to uh, sign the message in whatever wallet they've connected with. So pretty simple. We'll use the use SDK hook and then call sdk.wallet.sign. So let's grab the use SDK hook. So say const SDK is equal to use SDK. Again, import that from the app, the web dev slash react package up here. So then down here, we're going to say, let's sign the message. So we'll say const signature is equal to await sdk.wallet.sign. And we pass in the challenge and I believe it's dot text here. So if you remember in this function, we're returning a challenge query type and that is an object that contains an object called challenge, which contains a string called text. So when we make this request to the Lens GraphQL API, we'll get back this object, contains challenge.txt, and then we use that challenge.txt to ask the user to sign that message. And we'll show you what that looks like in just a second here. So that is step two here. Step three is to send the sign challenge to the Lens API. And if you remember, we added this GraphQL query, the GraphQL mutation rather, inside of our GraphQL folder here called Authenticate. So this accepts a signed auth challenge and returns a access token and refresh token. So what we're doing here is we've got the signed message now. And what we're gonna do is we're going to send that to the Lens API using that mutation. And if we go to the generated.ts file, we'll have a use mutation hook generated for us for the use authenticate, uh, which is reflecting that authenticate.graphql file, which is the uh, same hook that gets generated here. So we write the authenticate.graphql, run that npm run code gen, get this use authenticate mutation, which is using the React query use mutation under the hood and uses the uh, query to send that mutation to the GraphQL server. So what we can do is just import the use authenticate <laughs> use authenticate mutation into our use login hook. So that is the third step here. We're gonna say const and we can use the use uh, authenticate mutation and we'll see what this requires us to pass in here. What do we need? We need uh, to import it is what it's complaining about. So import that from the GraphQL generated file and it doesn't look like we need any options in this particular hook. So what we can destructure out of this is instead of data, we are writing um, some, uh, we're performing a write rather than a read here. So instead of reading data, we're going to grab something called mutate, which is the actual function. And we can also grab something called mutate async, which is an async version of the function that's actually being run. So when we call this mutate function, that's actually going to run the underlying logic of what's inside of this hook. And we can get the same flags like is loading, is error, all of these things inside of this uh, use mutation hook as you would with the use query hook. So I'm gonna be using the mutate async just because we're inside of an async function. And what you can do in JavaScript is just say, let's rename this variable by adding this colon here to say mutate async is kind of a janky word. Let's call this send signed message. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Send the signed message to the GraphQL server to get back our access token. So now we have the signed message. Let's say const, uh, let's just put X here and we'll say await send signed message. And within these parentheses, we need to provide the request. And within the request, we need to provide the address. And we also need to provide the signature. I'm just gonna sort of shorthand this to say uh, the variable name is the same as the key. So we can just reduce this to address and signature. We don't need the keys of the object here. So this is going to return something that I'm actually not sure what it does. So we can take a look, it returns authenticate and we can take a look at that. So within authenticate, we have the refresh token and the access token. Within the access token, there is an expiration date. So we have the three fields that we were talking about in that diagram. We have the access token, the refresh token, and the, the expiration date is actually inside of the access token. And we'll write some kind of helper functions to help us pass that out and uh, store it in local storage as well. So now we 
I have kind of this three-step process. We get the challenge, we sign the challenge, send that challenge back, and we have the access token and the refresh token available in this authenticate variable here. So we're done with step one here. We've actually written the async function that we want to perform. Now what we're going to return is the use mutation hook, which gets imported at line one here from at tanstack slash react query. And we're going to just wrap our login function inside of that use mutation query here. So what we're gonna do after this step is we get back the access token and we store the access token inside local storage. And we just need a few kind of helper functions to um, perform these actions like writing to local storage, passing the JWT or JWT token and adding that into the local storage that we can actually use the access token when we go to send requests. And that means we've done the full authentication flow from uh, kind of signing the message, sending it back to Lens, and then we can use the access token to send requests. So maybe before we do that, what I'll show you is what we've actually done so far. So what I'll do is console.log authenticated, and we'll print out the authenticate variable. Then on the home page, let's give you a quick demo of what we can actually do here. So let's say const address is equal use address, and we'll say if not address, we'll return the connect wallet button. And then what we'll do is we'll say if, and we'll say otherwise, we'll return a button that on click uses the hook that we just made. So we'll say const um, mutate is equal to use login and we'll report, import that from our use login hook. So now we have the function that calls this login function called mutate here. We can rename mutate to say uh, request login. And in the onclick handler down here, we can say, let's ask the user to call that request login function. And this button will just say login, close that button off. And let's test this out at localhost 3000 here. And we'll say yarn dev, and we'll open up localhost 3000. And what we'll do is I'll do it on my main account, which has my um, lens profile associated to it. So we see the connect wallet button here. We then ask to connect to our website first. So we'll log into our wallet and then we see this tiny little login button here when we have a connected wallet. So we click this. What should happen is we get a message back from Lens. We then ask the user to sign this message. So step one in our use login function was to get the challenge from Lens. So we've pulled the challenge from the GraphQL API. We've then performed step two, which is ask the user to sign the message and pass in the text of the message. So here's where we are now. We're asking the user to sign a message that says, this website wants you to sign in with your account. Here's all the details of what message you're signing. When we sign this, this is going to get sent back to the Lens API. And in return, we'll get the uh, authenticate variable here, which contains our access token. So if we sign this message, we're proving that we own this wallet. We're saying, okay, I'm able to sign a message sent to this address. Here's my proof that I'm signing it. And in return, we'll send that back to Lens and in the console, we'll be able to see authenticated is an object. And within here, we have the access token and the refresh token. So now what we need to do is we need to kind of pass this and format this and then store it into local storage now. Cool, so we'll jump back into code and within our auth folder here, let's create a new file called helpers.ts. And this is just going to consist of a couple of helpful functions that allow us to read and write data to the local storage and manage the tokens that we get back. So the first one that we're going to do is we're going to have one for reading the access token from storage. We'll have one for setting the access token in storage. And we'll also have one that allows us to pass the JWT token that comes back and extract the expiration date field. So we'll have one function called export function um, read access token, access token. We'll have one function called set access token. And this is going to accept something in here. Not exactly sure, we're just defining these variables here. We'll then have a new function called export function pass jot. 
and that's going to be responsible for uh, extracting the expiration date field. We'll then pass that into the set access token. And then if there is an available access token, we'll start to read those variables out of local storage. For uh, local storage, you can actually inspect what local storage looks like by going into your browser console and going to local storage here and checking out localhost 3000. You can see we have a key for the local storage value and we have a value for the local storage value as well. The one that we're going to be using is called LH storage key and that's literally just whatever you define. So in our helpers file, we're gonna set a constant variable called um, storage key and we're going to set this to be LH acts, uh, what do we call it? LH storage key. And LH just stands for lens hub, I believe. And this is just following uh, one of the other lens tutorials that I read. So we're going to store this storage key inside of the uh, local storage here and the value of that key will contain an object containing our access token, our expiration date, and our refresh token. For the pass jot function, I just did some quick Googling so that we don't have to use a library. And I found this answer on Stack Overflow that allows us to call the pass jot function without any library. So we're just gonna copy and paste this into our function here. The token is going to be a string, so we can change this to be TypeScript. And what it does is it takes in the access token and extracts out the token itself and also extracts out the expiration date for us. And what we can do is return the json.pass of this payload here. What that's going to give us is an object containing the access token and the expiration date so that we can kind of treat it as a regular JavaScript uh, object containing two fields rather than this big long string that we kind of have to manage throughout the project. So this is just a helper function that I've copy and pasted from Stack Overflow here. You can feel free to do the same. Hopefully I remember to link that in the description. Otherwise you can feel free to pause the video and copy and paste that if you are following along. Then to set the access token, we're going to pass in the access token itself. So we're gonna say access token is a first parameter and the refresh token is a second parameter here. And we're going to use this pass jot function to extract the expiration date out of the access token itself. So what we're gonna do is first pass the JWT token to get the expiration date. Date, sorry. And then we're going to set all three variables inside local storage using the storage key. So first we're going to say const expiration, which is one of the fields that gets returned by this object here from this function is equal to pass jot and we pass the access token into that function here. We're then going to set all of the variables inside of local storage. So we're going to first grab the local storage variable and we can do that by saying const local storage equal to uh, local storage or we can try do window.localStorage. If there's not local storage, we'll say, okay, this is not going to work. Uh, we might not be in a client side environment somehow. This probably won't happen. I'm just kind of being uh, extra safe to uh, make sure that we're being happy with TypeScript here. So if there is local storage, then we're going to call local storage .set item, And you can see the two parameters here. The first one is the key as we were inspecting in the browser previously. The key is the storage key that we're using here. So we're gonna say the key is equal to storage key. The value is going to be json.stringify. Whoops, okay, <laughs> there we go. That's exactly what I wanted. So json.stringify and we're passing the object containing the access token, which is passed in, the refresh token, which is also passed in and the expiration date, which is what we kind of destructured out of this pass jot function down here. So then when we call this set access token, this is what it will look like inside of local storage where we have the LH storage key as the key. The value is this object that contains access token, expiration date, and refresh token. And we can use these values to send authenticated requests to the Lens GraphQL server and use the expiration date to determine when we need to use the refresh token to request a new access token for us to uh, continue being in that authenticated state. Then for the reading of the access token, in theory, all we need to do is say local storage dot uh, get item and use this key and that will return the value for us. I'm just gonna do some kind of checks as well to say, make sure we're on a client environment because we need to be on a client environment to access local storage. So say const ls and we can actually make this even more type safe to say if 
type of window is undefined, then we'll just exit out of this function. If there is local storage inside of local storage or the window, then we can call uh, ls.get item out to pull the storage key value out of local storage. So we're gonna say, if there's not ls, we'll just throw another error again. If there is local storage available for us to use, we'll call ls.getItem, pass in the storage key, and that's just going to access our local storage as if it were a kind of dictionary to say, okay, let's look up this key. If there is that key, we'll return the value. If there's not, then we'll return um, null, I believe is what we're going to do. So we're going to say if, if there's not data, then we'll return null. If there is data, then we're going to return that in an object here. So we're going to say, um, return the json.pass data. And I kind of want to cast this because I believe this function is going to return any now, which is a bit gross. So I'm just going to say as, and we're going to say access token is string, refresh token is string, and the expiration date is number. So now this uh, function returns either null or an object containing the three fields that we're interested in, access token, <laughs> refresh token, and the expiration date here. I'm just gonna write one more helper function that determines if the expiration date is expired and you can use this logic in the browser itself. So let's take this expiration date. Let's just paste it into the console, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, how do I get rid of these settings? There we go. So this is the expiration date value that we get back. It's kind of in the format of a date number that you would expect to see. Uh, it just needs to be multiplied by a thousand. So let's say uh, new date, from the number that we pasted from the expiration date times 1000. And this will give us the date that our uh, access token expires. So our access token expires on the 27th of December, which is in five days from now. So we can do a simple function that says, okay, is this number times 1000 less than the current date? If it is, that means it's expired since the date dot now, the date that it is right now, is bigger than the date that the expiration date expired. I explained that terribly, but essentially, if the number that your expiration date is is smaller than the date dot now, that means your token is no longer valid. You need to get a new one to continue being authenticated. So we're gonna say a uh, simple function to say if the token is expired or not. So we're gonna say export function is token expired. That looks good to me. Probably need to pass in the token here. So let's say uh, expiration date number. And we'll say if, um, if there's not an expiration date, that'll be good. And then we're going to say if date dot now um, is greater than or equal to expiration date times 1000, then return true, then otherwise return false here. So if the date is bigger than the date of your expiration, then your token is no longer valid, you need to get a new one. If it's not, then you don't need to get a new one. <laughs> I probably could have explained that more concisely, so I'm sorry about that, but uh, hopefully that is clear in this code block here. Cool, so now back at our use login function, we can kind of continue the flow where we had that authenticate variable and we can use that inside of uh, local storage. So we need to actually just set it in local storage and we can import the uh, helper function that we just wrote to say set access token. And all we need to do is provide the access token and the refresh token, which we can get out of this authenticate variable here. So what we can do is say destructure the access token and refresh token out of the authenticate variable. You can see those are available here. And then we're going to send those to the helper function to set them in local storage. So we're gonna say set, uh, what do we call the function? Set access token. And we'll import that from our helpers file on line five here. And we're going to say set access token. The two parameters are the access token and the refresh token. Cool, so now if we test this out at localhost, let's go ahead and clear our existing kind of stuff. Let's zoom out a little bit here. So let's delete our access token. Let's re-trigger this flow here. And let's kind of begin this three-step process where we log in, we get that uh, challenge from Lens. We ask the user to sign the challenge here. We sign the challenge and I 
not sure what this is. I don't think that's related at all. <laughs> I think that's just my browser acting weird. But this is what we get back from the signed challenge. We send it to the uh, Lens protocol again. It says, okay, here's my proof that I own this wallet. Now, what we should see in our application is that LH storage key gets set with all of our new stuff. And this date is when our token expires. So we're gonna say new date uh, from that number times 1000. And that is 22nd of December in about 30 minutes. Yeah, that looks good to me. So the token seems to last about 30 minutes as I was kind of hoping in my diagram when I was explaining it earlier, that is 30 minutes from now. So when 30 minutes has expired, this access token that we have inside of the application tab here is no longer going to be valid. It can't be used for making authenticated requests anymore. We'll need to use this refresh token to request a new access token. So that is a separate function that we can build is called the refresh access token function. And we're going to follow a very similar pattern of what we did inside of this generate challenge function where we're not going to use a hook. We're just going to extract this out into an async function using the generated code. So what that process is, is go to the generated file. And what we can do is we can search for refresh, uh, use refresh mutation, it will be called. And we can copy and paste this fetcher logic into this uh, function here. So what we're gonna do is we'll copy this. We'll go to our uh, previous file, which was the, did we create it? We did, refresh access token. And then we're gonna say export default async function, refresh access token. And this is going to take our current refresh token, send it to Lens and say, hey, I need a new access token. Can you please grant me one? So what we're gonna do is say, get our current uh, refresh token from local storage and then send it to Lens to ask for a new access token then set the new access token in local storage. Cool, so the first step is what we're going to copy and paste in and we'll auto import all of these things here. So we're importing fetcher and we're importing the refresh mutation, which is what we get back from this uh, mutation. So we get back a new access token, we get back a new refresh token we are using the mutation variables as what we need to pass into this mutation to have a successful um, request or post request to the GraphQL server. And the refresh document is the actual GraphQL logic that we're sending in that request. So in the variables here, let's replace this. And what we're gonna say is in the variables, we pass the request, which requires the refresh token which we need to provide as part of either the parameter here or we can directly read it from the local storage. So what I'm going to do here is, I think we can actually just read it from local storage. It's probably easier. Uh, we'll say read uh, the refresh token from storage. So in our helper file, we have a function called read access token and this returns the refresh token. So let's say read access token const uh, refresh token equal to read access token again. And this is going to return this object or null here. So we'll grab the refresh token out of this dot refresh token. And this will either be null or a string now. So we can say, pass the refresh token into this request. And if there's not a refresh token, we can just return null from this function here and when we have this, we're going to await the results. So we're going to say um, const result is equal to await this fetch. And then within re result, we get a refresh mutation type back. So you can take a look at what that looks like. We'll get result.refresh.access token and refresh token here. So then what we need to do is call that helper function called set access token. And we can pass these two variables in as we did when we first got those um, tokens back from the API. So what we'll do is we'll say, um, send it to Lens. So that is step two here. Step one was read it from access, uh, read it from local storage. Step three is to actually set the value. So we're going to say, 
um, set access token, and we're going to destructure the uh, access token and refresh token out of the result here. So we're going to say const uh, const access token refresh token is equal to result dot refresh. Yeah, that looks good to me. Um, let's rename this top one since we have conflicting variable names. So let's say current refresh token and let's rename that, pass the current refresh token in. Then we get a new refresh token. So let's call this new refresh token and we'll set those in the uh, helper function here to store them in local storage. So we'll say access token and new refresh token. Excellent, okay, so now we have the refresh function. This will return a null, or maybe we wanna return something from this function here. So we'll say return the access token is probably what we're most interested in. And that looks good to me. So access token, let's cast this as a string. And this will now return either a string or null. So when we await this, it's going to fetch the new access token from the Lens GraphQL API by providing the refresh token. Then we're gonna set it in local storage. So we kind of update our local storage state to say, okay, here's my new access token. I'm authenticated again, and we can return the access token value in case we need that elsewhere as well. Now we can go back to our original auth fetcher function and visit this to do that we made saying, let's add the authentication headers in here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to write a little function that uh, checks for the existing access token. If there is an access token, we'll check for the expiration and refresh it if we need to. Then we'll pass that along with the headers of the actual request here. So we're gonna say a little function called read access token or get access token. And what we're gonna do within here is first we'll check the local storage for the access token. If there is a token, then check its expiration. If there isn't a token, then just return null. That means they're not signed in, not signed in. Then if it's expired, update it using the refresh, refresh token. And we'll finally just return, return the token. So the first check is to say const token is equal to using that helper function that we wrote here called uh, read access token. So we'll say const token is equal to read access token. And this stores the access token, the refresh token and the expiration date. What I want to do as well is make a mutable variable called let access token equals token dot access token. And we'll make a quick null check so we don't have this uh, question mark here. We'll say if there's no token, then just return null. That means they're not signed in. So that's that step done there. So that is step number two, let's say. If there is a token, then check its expiration. So this is step number three. We'll grab the um, access token here. So if uh, if token dot exp uh, is expired, so we have a helper function for this. So we we'll say if is token expired, pass the token dot exp into that function, and we'll say if it is expired, then we need to refresh it. So that's step four here. Say if it is expired, update it using the refresh token. So we do have a method for this. It's called refresh access token. So we'll say const new token is equal to await refresh access token. And we'll import that on line number two here from the uh, helper function that we wrote. So this is going to give us back the new access token as a string. So then we can use that to say access token equals new token. Since this is actually just the string itself uh, this somehow returns null here. We'll say if not new token return null, just in case something goes wrong with that function. So now access token either stores the current token or if it's expired, we get a new one and then stores the new token. So now down here, we can just say return access token and that will always be either a valid token 
or uh, a valid token that got refreshed in this process in step three here. So now what we can do is pass the token that we get from this function into each of the requests to make them authenticated. You can see inside of the authentication quick start how to send authenticated requests to the Lens GraphQL API. Inside of the headers, we need to provide this authorization flag and pass the bearer containing the access token. So for us, that's gonna look a little bit different uh, the way that we're setting it up. We're not using Apollo, so we just need to change it up a little bit, but it's relatively similar. So the first step is to actually get the access token. So we're going to say const token, and we wanna make sure we're on a client side environment here. So we're going to say if type of window uh, type of window is equal to undefined, um, then we'll return null. So if we're in a server side environment, we don't have access to the token, we'll just return null. If we are uh, in a client side environment, then we'll await the result of getting the access token. So token now is either a string if the user is signed in, or it's null if the user is not signed in or we don't have access to the local storage to actually read the information. So that's what token is now. We're calling this function that we just wrote up here and awaiting that result. So then inside of the headers, what we can do is provide a flag called X access token. And this is going to either be the token itself if there is one, if there's not a token, then we'll just return an empty string to suggest this is not an authenticated request. So we're going to say if there's a token, then use the token, otherwise we'll just return an empty string. This is going to allow us to automatically send the authentication information along with any request that we make to the Lens GraphQL API. It's most important when you're making mutations, you can go to the Lens docs and see in some of the mutations, for example, creating a profile or uh, let's see, creating a post or something like that. Just find a quick example here. Uh, creating a post, you can see this request is protected by authentication. This means it requires an X access token header to put in request with your authentication token. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're providing the X access token header to provide that authentication information. And we're doing that automatically every time we make the request to say, okay, we don't have to kind of specify that this is an authenticated request each time. We're just saying, Every time we send information or request information from Lens, let's use the access token. If it's expired, let's refresh it and send that automatically along with the request. One other thing that I helped, uh, sorry, that helped me was adding this cause control where we have access control allow origin set to this wildcard star here. I don't exactly know what this does to be perfectly honest with you. I just added it and it helped me with a lot of errors that I was having down the line with some cause access control issues. So feel free to do the same if you kind of want to uh, avoid running into cause issues down the line. We can take a look at what we've actually just done inside of the browser here. So if we go back to our local history thousand and we click the login button again, ooh, uh, maximum call stack size exceeded. Looks like we have a bit of a bug. Uh, looks like we have an infinite loop between refresh and get access token. So that's interesting. We're going to refresh. So if the token is expired, then we refresh access token. That's interesting. Refresh access token if the token is expired. So if token is expired, returns true if there's no token. Uh, returns true if the date dot now is greater. I think this is the wrong wrong way around. So console.log expiration, console.log date dot now. Let's just quickly confirm this. So expiration times 1000. And then we'll say uh, console.log is expired is our logic here. So date dot now is greater than or equal to, I think this is the wrong way around. Uh, so let's quickly confirm it. Go to the local history thousand here. Let's click login. So this is getting called over and over and over again. So the first value here is our expiration date and the date dot now is bigger. So the date dot now is in the future compared to our expiration date, yet that is true, right? So. The expiration date is this, 
the date that we're comparing against is this. So which one's bigger here? The expiration date is not bigger than the date here. I think I'm confusing myself, so <laughs> let's make a new date. A uh, new date from the expiration date and a new date from the date.now. So the expiration date is 37 minutes and the date from now is bigger, so it's not expired, yet we're returning true here. So I think there's a bug uh, in our is token expired function here. So let's rewrite this quickly. So say if, uh, if expiration is less than date.now, that's not true. I think we can just flip what we had. So we'll say return false, return true. So if the date.now is bigger than the expiration date, that means it's not expired. So we had a, a bug in this function here. I'm hoping that's what's the problem here. So we'll quickly try this again. And we'll say login looks better now. It looks like it's not just infinitely looping. So we get the request back, we sign the request, we get these weird errors of my console, we can ignore those. And we get the authenticated state back inside of our application now. We can see our stuff is set in local storage. And what we should be able to see is in the network, um, let's see, in the payload, request, headers, I wanna see the X access token being sent as part of these headers here. Here we go, so here's the X access token as part of the headers. So automatically, we're associating our authenticated state inside of the token, and that gets sent along to all of the requests to the Lens GraphQL API automatically for us. Now that we have all of this authentication set up in our project, we can go back to the uh, original kind of Lens API examples, GitHub repository, and we can go grab the query from the GraphQL folder again to grab the currently um, signed in profile. And I believe it's called default, default profile. Yep, get default profile or get profile. One of these is what we're interested in. So default profile request or single profile query request. So either way we get a profile back. Uh, I believe what we're interested in is get default profile here. So let's copy and paste this into our GraphQL folder. We'll go create a new file called get default profile.graphql and we'll paste that into our project here. So this takes in a default profile request and returns the information about a given profile. And we're going to use this to build out a use lens user hook so that in the original kind of sign-in button that we were building, we can grab the information about the currently signed in lens user and say, hey, you're signed in, here's your lens profile, or sorry, you don't have a lens profile yet, you can't use this platform and we can display things like their profile picture and their handle as well. So that's what we're going to set up using this um, get default profile query. We'll get the information about the currently authenticated user and then we'll show that information to the user on the UI. We'll also include some kind of state to say whether or not the user is signed in and we can show that inside of the sign in button as well. So in our auth folder here, we'll create a new file called use lens user .ts. And what this is going to do is grab the um, default profile using that GraphQL query that we just imported. So that reminds me we need to actually run the npm run code gen command, and that's going to generate the hook for us to grab the authenticated user from the, sorry, grab the default profile. So we'll get a query called use default profile query, and this will return the information about the user's profile, such as their name, their bio, and things like that. So that's what we're going to use for this uh, use lens user hook. So we'll go back to this file, and what we'll do is we'll say export default function use lens user. Within this, we want to make a check for the information in the local storage. So what I'm gonna do here is make a use query. So we're gonna say import um, use query from at tanstack query. And we'll also uh, import the use address hook. So we'll say import use address 
from the React SDK from Third Web. So what we'll do here is first uh, make a query, make a React query for the local storage key. Um, and what we'll do is we'll say, if there's an address, then use that uh, generated hook that we made called use default profile to load up the profile. We'll also append this flag to say, uh, if there's stuff inside of local storage, that means they're signed in, we can add the is signed in flag within here. So this is not what it does, uh, use address, it just returns the string. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna say, uh, make a query using the local storage. So say const local storage query is equal to use query and we need the cache key here. So we're gonna say uh, an array of items which is lens user as the key and we'll also append the address of the wallet address that we're checking to make this key unique between users. So we're going to say the cache key for this item is called lens user and uh, the second kind of aspect to that key is the address. So for example, my wallet address is going to have a unique cache key compared to your wallet address when we're checking if we've we've already got this data available inside of our React query cache. So that's what the first aspect of this is here. The second is writing the actual function to check um, the local storage for the signed in or authentication information. For this part, I think we'll use the helper functions that we wrote for reading the access token. So we can actually just say, use this function as the logic that we're checking for the actual query. So we're gonna import the um, use access token, I believe it was. So you import um, read access token from helpers. And this is going to be the function that we actually perform here. So we're gonna say within here, we're going to say uh, an arrow function called const token is equal to read access token and return that. I believe that's all we need for local storage query. So you can see this now wraps our query for local storage inside of the use query result and returns either null or the object here. So local storage.data, for example, is now either null or contains the field. So you can see it automatically appends that question mark because it might be null but we can access the access token, the expiration date, and the refresh token from the data of that query. What we're going to do next is we're going to use that generated query to say, okay, when the address is available, let's fetch that user's default profile from lens. So we're gonna say use default profile query. And what we'll do is we can use the hook that we've imported up the top here. So we'll say import use default profile query from at GraphQL generated. And we'll use that to actually get the uh, profile for the connected wallet address. So what we're gonna say is if there is a connected wallet, then we can ask for the default profile from lens. So we're gonna say down here, we're gonna say const profile query is equal to use default profile query. And what we need to pass into this is a request containing the address. So Ethereum address is equal to address, which is their wallet address. This will give us back information such as profile query dot data dot default profile and gives us back all of the information such as the name, the ID, the handle, the picture, all of that good stuff that we can use to kind of display on the UI. What's really awesome about React Query is you don't wanna make this request unless you have the address available. So we can add a separate kind of option here to say enabled, which means when this address will fire, when the kind of right side of this is true. So we only want uh, enabled to fire, let's say for example, if bananas <laughs> is equal to uh, bananas, for example. So this will only fire when bananas is equal to bananas, which is true, right? But if bananas was not equal to bananas, then this will never fire, okay? So this is a dumb example, but what I'm trying to say is enabled means this query will actually fire when this condition is true. And we only want the request to fire when the user has a connected address because we can't ask for a default profile if there isn't an address available. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to say if address is not equal uh, undefined or a cleaner way of saying this is 
bang, bang, address. And that just means address is available. So now profile query will be loading until there is available address. When that address becomes available, it says, okay, now I'm enabled. I'm going to actually perform the query and then we'll get the information back such as users default profile uh, about the information containing the information about their profile, sorry, such as the handle, their name, their profile picture and things like that. So now we have information about the user's lens profile. We have information on whether or not they're connected to our website. And the thing is we wanna return their lens profile and we also wanna return whether they're signed in or not. And there's an important note here that these are two separate things, right? Because they could be connected and they could also have a lens profile, but that doesn't necessarily mean they've authenticated because they don't need to authenticate for us to load this query about what profile is stored at this uh, wallet address here, right? So what we wanna do down here is we're going to return an object that contains information about both the local storage and the information about the lens profile. And I've just noticed something bothering me about this line here. This could be a lot more simpler. We can just point to that function rather than have this uh, logic here. So we're gonna just say uh, arrow function that returns the read access token and that will return, I uh, believe it's still the same. So we just simplified that a little bit. So what we're gonna do at the bottom of this file is we're going to return the local storage query and we're also going to return the profile query. And the way that we can do that is by returning an object that says, well, here's the query about the signed in status. So we're gonna say is signed in, uh, is signed in query. And we're going to say local storage query. And then we're gonna say profile query. And let's just make it a little bit uh, nicer by saying, we're returning an object with one key that says is signed in query that returns this part of the logic to say they've authenticated or not. The second part is to suggest they have actually got a profile available and have connected their wallet to our website. Now we can go back to our original sign in button that <laughs> feels like an eternity ago, but we actually have access to all of the information that we wanted to display here originally. So we can use the two queries that are exporting from the use lens user hook. So we say, const is equal to use lens user. And we'll also import the use login. So we'll say const is equal to use login, import that from our lib slash auth and lib slash auth here. So we're going to say within here, we can destructure the is signed in query and the profile query from use lens user. We'll then destructure the mutate out of the use login here. So we can ask the user to log in. So we'll say request login is what that function is going to be renamed to. So now we can ask the users to log in. We can also access their logged in state and their profile uh, stored on lens. So now we have a couple of different states. We're going to say uh, loading their signed in state, I would say. So we'll say if is signed in query is loading, we'll return a loading state. We'll then say if the user uh, is not signed in, we need to request a login. So we'll say if the loading state of the signed in query is false and the data is null. So we'll say if is signed in query dot data and not that. So if there's no data or the, I think that's actually not correct. So if signed in query dot data equals null, let's say. Oh, uh, we can do not null. I think that not data. I think that makes sense. So if not data, we can return the button that requests the user to log in. So we'll say request login when the user clicks this button. So we'll say button sign in with lens. And we'll say on click here. We'll have an arrow function that calls the request login function here. And I don't believe that requires any variables. Uh, that's just calling the login function that we wrote here. So that's gonna trigger that kind of three-step process of getting the query, uh, using the query to sign the message and sending that back to Lens, get the access token. So then they'll sign in. Then we have a state to say loading their profile information. So we'll say if profile query is loading, return another loading state. Then we can say, okay, if it's not loading, if it's done loading and there's no default profile, then we're gonna say if profile query.data 
dot default profile, which can be undefined or null. So we can say not this. And then we can say you don't have a profile, no lens profile. If that check passes and we do have a profile, then we can actually show the information about the user finally. So we can say if, um, if profile query dot data dot default profile, then we can say hello uh, default profile and let's use the handle. So we'll just say hello uh, at jaredwatts.lens, for example. I think this logic is going to work. If we go to our homepage and we just delete everything, replace it with the sign in button here, uh, we might need a default state to say return, uh, I don't know, let's just say return div that says something went wrong. That sounds good to me. So this is just our final state. If something here didn't work out, then I'm not sure what state we're in. Something's probably gone wrong. So that will be our default state. On the index page, we'll import the sign in button and just simply render that button so we can test it out. So if we go to localhost 3000, you can see we have hello jaredwatts.lens and that seems to be working actually. Um, that's impressive, okay? So we clear the localhost local storage key and maybe let's disconnect our wallet as well here. So we'll say connected sites, disconnect from localhost, disconnect. Cool, so it goes back to signing with Lens. Here's what I was hoping to see. So initially we see the connect wallet uh, button here. We can use these three services available. So let's connect to MetaMask. We connect to our MetaMask wallet with the Lens profile NFT in there. We connect. We then don't have the information about uh, signing in in local storage. So that's this kind of check here to say, okay, we're done loading the is signed in query. We can then say, hey, you need to sign in with Lens because there's no data available in local storage. So we'll click sign in with Lens. We'll see we need to sign the message. We kick off that flow in the use login. We then should have this stuff inside of the application here. And the state reflects here, but that was a little bit slow. Uh, I wonder if we can fix that. So let's try this again. We have application and it's loading, 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 loading. I think there's a bigger problem here <laughs> that we might need to address because I think we might be stuck in an infinite loop again here. So we are, we're stuck in maximum core stack size exceeded. So we'll need to kind of debug this um, auth fetch. I think I know what's happening inside of that file, but we'll go ahead and try and fix that next. So we're getting this kind of infinite loop between refresh and get access token that we saw previously. Inside of the auth fetcher file, if we take a look at how this actually works, there is a bug that is causing this infinite loop because we're saying when we make a request, when we perform this fetch, we're getting the access token. When we get the access token, if it's expired, we call refresh access token. The refresh performs a fetch and the fetch, as we know, goes back to this file and says, okay, get the access token. It again says, okay, is the token expired? Yes, of course it is. We just tried to refresh it. Okay, it's expired, let's get a new one. Let's fetch that. Okay, let's go back and get a new access token. And it goes from here to this function, to here, to this function, to here, to this function, to here. So the problem is this refresh access token is using this fetcher method here. When that gets called, it tries to send along the authentication header request and to do that, we need to get the access token, which then gets stuck in this infinite loop. It says, all right, it's still expired, so I need a new access token. I, I, I'm gonna go get a new access token now. All right, let's try and get one, get an access token. And you can see, we just go from here to here to here, and we get stuck in this infinite loop of infinitely asking Lens for a new access token. So to fix this, what we can do is not use this uh, fetcher function inside of the refresh access token function because when we hit this function, we're hitting problems because we request the fetcher to perform this fetch and it says, all right, I need a new access token. So we get stuck in this loop. So if we just decide not to use the fetcher, don't request a new access token every time that we get stuck in this loop, we'll change this to just use a perform 
uh, a regular fetch that we're using inside of this function here. So what we'll do is we'll copy this kind of uh, signature here and we'll copy this. So we're going to make a new async function fetch data and we'll paste the signature in here. So then this is going to be a function that just performs the regular fetch. So we can actually literally just copy and paste this code in here. Let's say copy this whole async function within these curly brackets. We'll say we don't need this. We can get rid of the authentication. We can get rid of that line regarding the authentication here. And then that just performs a regular fetch. Let's cut this out for a minute. Just see where we're going wrong. Um, close this off. What have we done wrong here? Uh, not exactly sure. I think we have one too many curly brackets. There we go. So then we can perform the rest of it. And I know this is really messy, but we'll go over what we've just done. Um, we need to perform fetch data here. So we'll say, instead of performing the result on the fetcher, let's perform it on the actual fetch itself. So we'll say await fetch data, pass in all the stuff that we did and send the refresh token as part of the request here. So inside of the request, we'll send the refresh token, current refresh token. And I know that was probably impossible to follow what we just did, but instead of using the fetcher now that is defined in auth fetcher, what we're doing is we're actually just performing a normal fetch rather than requesting the access token and assigning that inside of the headers because we know that's going to not be available inside of refresh access token. When we're in this function, we don't need to say, hey, let's send uh, additional authorization headers because the user is not authenticated, right? Inside of this function, we're performing the authentication. So we don't need the header ever in this request. So that gives us out of the infinite loop and just performs this once to say, okay, here's, we're going to send a post request to the Lens API. We're going to ignore the authentication headers now so we don't get stuck in this infinite loop where we would normally request a new uh, refresh token here, which causes the infinite loop, All right? That's why we're doing this. So we cut out the step to get another uh, access token and then we just continue with the rest of it. And instead of using the fetch up, we just perform this function to say, okay, let's get the access token and the refresh token, and then continue on with the logic that we had, which was setting that information inside of local storage here. Cool, all right, so what that's going to do is, hopefully this returns something. Um, looks like it's hopefully good. So we'll say, wait, fetch data returns the uh, request, refresh, request, and that is what's happening here. So we're going to say fetch data, takes in a generic T data, T variables, takes in the query, takes in the variables options, and returns a promise of type any, which doesn't quite look correct. What's going wrong here? This is not typed anymore. Um, so T data, uh, we need to say promise. It's a return type of this. So we're going to say this returns promise of T data. Uh, let's say that looks good. So then refresh mutation. What do we return here? So we're going to say uh, const result is equal to that. And then we'll say const is equal to result. What can we get out of this? We can get the refresh and then we can get the access token and the new refresh token out of this. So then now it's type safe and we use that T data type to say, okay, this has to return this kind of information, which in our case is the refresh mutation, which contains access token and refresh token. I feel like that was probably a little confusing. So I'm sorry that that little mistake happened, but essentially all we've done is now when we call this refresh access token function, we know that the access token is expired, right? That's why we're calling this function. So we don't, inside of the refresh access token function, previously, we would say, use the function defined in here to get stuck in this loop to say, we infinitely request 
new refresh tokens. And we never reach this because the token is always expired, right? Once it's expired, it refreshes it, calls this function again. Still expired, refreshes it, calls this function again. Still expired, refreshes it, calls this function. And we never actually reach the point where we're at a state where the new token is available for us to continue with the request. What we did by extracting it out into the kind of manual fetch here is we're still doing the exact same thing. All we're excluding is not including this um, auth header here. So we don't say, hey, am I signed in? We know we're not signed in, so we don't need to perform that check. We're just saying, hey, send this to Lens, give me a new access token based on the refresh token that we're getting from local storage here. So that's why we've extracted this way. And all we're doing is again, sending it in local storage so that we can continue when we call this function, the refresh token is now available and we actually reach this point so we don't get stuck in that infinite loop. And we can hopefully see that on the UI here that now this doesn't get stuck in an infinite loop. We connect to our wallet and now we can finally see our lens profile being displayed to us on the UI. So that's awesome to see. We can then go to use lens user and console.log the profile data. So we we'll say profile query dot data dot default profile. And we can take a look at all of the information about the connected wallets lens profile. So you can see here, we have the handle, we have the ID, we have the metadata, we have the name, all of this information that's coming back from the default profile query request. And we know now this user is signed in. We know they have a lens profile and they're in a state where they're authenticated. They have a lens profile. They're ready to start interacting with the content on our actual application. One thing we noticed before though, was if we perform the full flow, so we go into a disconnected state, let's disconnect here and let's clear our local storage again. So we pretend we never signed in, we've never connected. What we noticed before was that there was a little sort of section of time where we were connected and we were signed in and we have a lens profile, but it wasn't showing that on the UI. So if I sign in here, ideally that uh, information is displayed immediately on the UI. If we click out and click back in, it is available because React query is saying, hey, let's rerun the query, get the most up-to-date data. What we need to do is when the user signs in, we need to say, hey, can you re-trigger this and say, there's new information available, you need to refresh what's happening in this query. And where we do that is inside of the use login hook. So once we've set the access token, what we need to do now is inside of the use lens user hook, we have this query that says, let's constantly check to see if the user is signed in at this cache key, right? When we weren't signed in, this wasn't, there's nothing at this cache key. So we're returning null for this query. So local storage query dot data is null. We then continue on, we can have the default profile, whatever, but we're never signed in and is signed in query says, hey, there's nothing in local storage until you refresh it by coming back to the page and saying, hey, let's rerun this query. That's what React Query does automatically. But after we sign in, we're setting that information in local storage. So we wanna say to this local storage query here, hey, you need to rerun. I've just changed some stuff in local storage. Can you please check the query again? Re-trigger this because now there's new information available. So when we sign in, what we're gonna do down here is say, now let's ask React Query to refetch the cache key, which is use lens user here. So we'll refetch this and we'll perform this whole query again. So we're going to say, let's copy and paste this and let's refetch this cache key. And that is going to sort of tell React Query and let it know, hey, there's new information available for this query, can you just check it out and make sure that your data is up to date? So what we can do for that is import a hook from a React Query. I'm trying to think of the name. It is use provider, I believe it is. Um, const is equal to use provider, use, uh, I think we might need to go to the docs here. <laughs> React Query, let's see, use, uh, use provider or something like that, use query client. So it's use uh, query client from at Tansac react query. So use query client. 
now we have access to the client and we can ask it to say, hey, can you check this query out again? So we're going to say client and we can say invalidate queries. And what this does is invalidates or says this query that you're about to pass in is no longer valid. Can you please recheck that value? So we're going to say invalidate queries. And the key that we're invalidating is what we're checking here for the local storage. So we're saying invalidate the query of a lens user and address. So that is going to trigger this to rerun when you log in. So let's check this new flow out. We'll inspect it again, go to application, clear out our storage, we'll sign out as well. So we'll disconnect from our website here. And again, we'll give it a quick refresh. So we'll say, all right, we connect our wallet. So we're connected to the website. We check local storage, nothing's there, right? We sign in. After we sign this message, there will be something in local storage. And previously we would just set it. And this query would say, uh, I checked, there's nothing there. We'll set it and then we'll say, hey, you need to check again. I've just changed some stuff. Can you please uh, run that query again? So we sign it. And now what we see is without exiting the page, that query gets rerun because we've invalidated that inside of this line here to say, hey, you need to rerun and check the local storage again because I've just changed some stuff in there. Can you please make sure you have the most up-to-date data? And that way we get, whoops, that's not what you wanna see. That way we automatically kind of rerun that query and that is reflected on the UI because we're checking inside of this sign-in button to say, okay, now there is a default profile. Let's run that and show that on the UI. So it might feel like we've done a lot of work so far to display a name on the page, right? But a lot of the foundation that we've laid out is going to enable us to write super clean, efficient code at a really fast pace to actually build out the features that we're going to build. The first one I wanna show you is how you can build out a kind of feed page where you can explore the top publications and display them on the UI. You'll be able to show the actual content of the post itself. You'll be able to show the author. You'll be able to show all of this kind of information in a social media style feed. And I'll show you how to do that on this homepage here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, on the homepage here, Let's create a feed of posts and let's say in here, we'll import the styles first. So we'll say import styles from uh, dot dot slash styles slash home dot module dot CSS. And you can feel free to pick and choose whatever styles you like. I'm just gonna be using CSS in this video because hopefully everybody knows a little bit of CSS. And what we're gonna do is we're going to display a container and we're going to have a feed of all of the posts. So to do that, we're going to use the generated query that we had from the explore publications uh, GraphQL query that we wrote. So we wrote this GraphQL query, if you remember, we generated that into a hook in the generated file here called use explore per publications query rather. And we're going to use this hook to get all of the top publications based on a kind of feed here. So to do that, we can say const is loading uh, error and data is equal to use uh, explore publications query and we need to pass a request in here and we're going to pass a sort criteria and that is equal to publication sort criteria dot uh, let's say uh, top collected for example let's say that will get the post with the most collections on them and what we'll do on the UI is we'll say have a nice little loading state we'll say Turn div, div class name is equal to styles our container. Uh, we'll say if loading, we'll say return a div, return a div of class name is equal to styles our container loading, and that needs to be is loading. We'll then say if there's an error, we'll do the exact same. We'll copy and paste this for the error. So if is error return error and we can just say that there won't be an error really i don't think unless we do something seriously wrong but then in the kind of default return here what we're going to do is we'll return a um just say hello world for now and we'll close that off and just make sure our code is actually compiling here cool so on localhost 3000 let's bring that over 
you can see we have loading and then hello world. Oh, cool, I rang out my other window, nice. So now we have the data. What we can do is uh, create a new component inside of our components folder that represents um, a post. So we'll say, uh, let's just call it feed post.tsx, put in some boilerplate code. So export default function feed post, and this is just a functional React component. What we're going to do within this state where we have data is we have access to the array of top explorations sorted by most collections. So what we'll do is we'll loop or iterate over the array of items inside the data field. So what we'll do is we'll say open curly brackets, data, and we can see we have these autocomplete suggestions. So we have data.explorepublications.items, which is an array of items. You can see in the type here, you have this big long object and at the, at the end you have this array symbol. So we have either zero or more items in this array and we can map over those items and access the current publication that we're iterating over inside of this field here. So essentially what we're doing is saying for every item inside this items array, let's transform that item into something, which is what we return in this, ex, uh, this section here. So if we say div uh, key is equal to the publication ID, so that's just a unique identifier for this div, then let's render the publication title just as a quick example. We can, I don't think it has a title, it doesn't look like, so let's say metadata dot name, and let's render that on the UI, you can see it's very, very big. Maybe let's uh, make that like a H3 or something like that, uh, just to make it a bit cleaner. So you can see these are the top 50 posts ordered by uh, most collections. So these are the names of all of these posts. What we're going to do instead is transform them into this feed post component. So we'll say, save that file. And instead of rendering a div here, we'll import feed post as the component from our components folder up here and we'll pass down the publication as a prop. So we'll say publication is equal to publication. And we also need to provide a unique key for this uh, feed post component as well. And it's complaining now that we don't have a publication prop accepted on this component. What we can do on the feed post component is inside of these props here, we can add a type for publication. And this is going to be the type that we need here which is a, whoops, I wish I could uh, hover over this, here we go, is a kind of type that we get back automatically generated for us. So we get type name explore publication result dot items is this big long array of items here. So inside of this prop type of that publication is going to be what we're passing in here. So this is the publication type and we can actually access that directly from what's getting returned from this query here. So what the data type is, is explore publications query. Whoops, explore publications query. So let's import that. Say explore publications query. And then we'll import that. On that data type, there's explore publications dot items. And we can use that to so say explore publications. And we'll use items here. And we'll just grab an example out of those items. So we're saying the publication type we're expecting is what we're iterating over here. So now it's happy that we're passing in the publication. And within here, we can say destructure the publication out of the props inside of these uh, brackets here. Within the div, then let's say, whoops, not div, uh, div. And we can say publication.metadata.name. And we get kind of the same effect on the uh, localhost 3000 here. So now this is just rendering inside of our component and we can write the code for rendering kind of the image, the name, the author, the author profile and things like that inside of this feed post component. So let's kind of set up the structure of what the feed post is going to be. I'm going to have a kind of top section to say, here's a div for uh, class name. So you go to styles.feed post container and we'll just close that off. And we'll have a header which contains the author profile picture. We'll have a header that contains the author profile name. And beneath the actual author information, we'll have a div that represents the post content. So we'll have last name equals styles.feed post content. 
within this we'll have the name of the post we'll have the description of the post uh, description of the post and we'll have the metadata are uh, the image or media of the post if there is one so that is kind of the boilerplate for what a feed post is going to look like and we need to kind of define where the styles are coming from. So we'll say import styles from a place that will create. So slash styles slash feed post dot module dot CSS. Let's go ahead and create that file now. Feed post dot module dot CSS. So we're importing the styles from here. And what we'll do is it's going to be a flex box that is a row. So our, our column rather will have a header that is a row that shows the author's profile picture and the name. So let's jump into the CSS on this window over here. So dot feed post container is going to be a display flex. It's going to be flex direction of column and we'll say uh, the background color can be, I don't know, like, um, <laughs> gray or something like that for now we'll clean it up a little bit we'll say the border radius is equal to 10 we'll have some padding on here we'll have 16 pixels of padding we'll then show margin bottom 16 that looks good to me what we want inside of the flex box is we'll have align items is equal to center and we'll have justify content is equal to center for now as well we'll then inside of this we'll have feed post header which itself is a flex box as well so we'll say display flex Flex direction is equal to row, align items is equal to center, and justify content is equal to flex start. We'll have a bit of a gap between them. So we'll say gap is equal to 12 pixels on the header. And the actual profile picture, so we'll say dot feed post profile picture is a circular image. So we'll say border radius is 50%, width can be 40, we'll say 48 pixels, height is 48 pixels. Border radius 50% is going to make it uh, circular. We'll maybe have a border of one pixel solid uh, black. That looks good. We'll then have dot feed post profile name, which will just be a simple font uh, size 16, font weight 600. I'm not that concerned about that. So here we'll say P class name is equal to styles dot feed post profile picture. And this is not going to be a P, sorry, that's just for the name. So we'll say P class name is equal to feed post profile name. Let's close that off and we'll say publication dot author or profile, sorry, profile dot name or publication dot profile dot handle in case they don't have a name. For the profile picture, we're going to use third webs IPFS media renderer components. So we'll go to the UI components documentation, go in here. We're going to import the media renderer from at the web dev slash react, because if we take a look at what is being printed out on the data here, we'll take a look in the console. We can see that the content uh, in this object here. So explore publications items and within each post or item, there's a profile about information about the person that created it. And you can see, for example, the image of the post inside of the metadata has an IPFS URL. So the URL is IPFS and we need a gateway to pull in that information from IPFS and display it on a browser such as Chrome. And what the IPFS media renderer does is detects what kind of file is stored at that URL and renders it on the UI. So we're going to import this from the React package provided by ThirdWeb. It also provides us a free gateway so that we can just provide the IPFS URL. We don't have to worry about checking if it's an IPFS URL or a centralized storage URL. We can just chuck in the URL here and it handles all of that complex logic for us. So we're just going to say, return the media renderer here. So we'll close these styles off for a bit to make it a bit more readable. Inside of the feed post, we'll say media renderer. And again, I think we imported it from the wrong file <laughs> before, but we'll import that from uh, the React package here. And we'll say the two required props are the source, and that's going to be publication.metadata.media. Uh, and this is going to be the 
uh, where was it? At localhost 3000. So this was media, the first media item dot original dot URL. So we'll say first media item zero dot original dot URL. Excellent. And then for the alt, we can say publication dot name or publication dot metadata dot name. And for the class name, I believe we called it feed post profile um, picture. So this is actually uh, what we want for the publication image. So we'll move that down here, sorry about that. So this is for the publication image. And then for the, we'll just add an empty string for in case there is no name of the post, we'll use the same logic for the actual picture of the profile. So I think I got a little confused of what I was talking about here, but in the profile, they also have a picture. If we scroll down the picture here, um, it's not happy with us for some reason. Uh, let's save this. Unhandled runtime. <laughs> okay. okay, I don't really care. I just want to see the structure of the data, please. Um, okay, what are we doing wrong here? Unsaved. Yeah, not exactly sure what's going on. Let's just comment this out for now. I just want to see the data. I'm sorry trying to show you the profile. So the profile also has a URL that's IPFS, right? So the profile dot uh, picture, here it is, picture dot original dot URL. So here we go. That's also an IPFS URL. Zoom in a little bit for you. The IPFS uh, also stores the profile picture sometimes as well. So we can use the media renderer for both the image of the actual post itself as well as the profile picture. So if there is media, we'll say we can render the media of the post inside of a media renderer. So we'll say if publication.metadata.media.length is greater than zero, then render that component for the actual post. We'll also do the same for the author. So we'll say media renderer for the source of the profile picture. So we'll say publication.profile.picture um, dot picture dot original dot URL. It doesn't look like the type safety was available there for some reason. So we'll just TS ignore this for now and say the type does exist. And the alt is equal to publication dot profile dot name or their handle. So let's close that off as well. Cool. And for the class name, so style this, we'll say class name is equal to styles dot feed post profile picture. Awesome. Okay, so let's go back to our localhost 3000 here. And this is saying, cannot read properties of undefined, reading URL. So this is saying maybe there isn't a profile picture for that person. So we can say if there is a uh, URL, we'll just add some null checks here. And if there isn't, we'll just render uh, nothing. We'll render an empty image for now. So, wow, that's massive. Okay, the posts are too big um, <laughs> for the actual content. So let's add a class name for the feed post uh, content image. We'll say height is equal to, uh, let's say 256 pixels. And we'll add that class name to the publications media as well. So we'll say feed post content image is a class name for the actual image that's associated with the post. And we'll add a quick TS ignore here just to make it happy. And if we take a look at localhost 3000 now, you can see we have the videos where the videos are available. We have the pictures generated where the pictures are available. And you can see if you scroll down, we have this nice social media style feed of the most collected posts on the lens protocol. What's awesome about the IPFS media renderer is you automatically get the relevant HTML tag based on what media people are uploading to IPFS or uploading to Lens Protocol. So for example, we have Chris Comrie here who's posted a video to Lens Protocol and it's automatically generated a video tag for us where we can click play and we can get sound on the video tag that's rendered onto the HTML here 
and we get images for the images posted. We get media, uh, sorry, we get audio tags for the MP3 files and things posted to IPFS. So we get a very kind of dynamic social media feed that you would expect of things like Twitter and Facebook and those kind of social media platforms. So let's go ahead and clean this up a bit. We'll add some more metadata about the post, such as the name of the post and the contents of the post. So let's say, uh, let's give this a H3, for example, to say the name of the post, say publication dot med metadata dot uh, name. We'll then say the description or the actual contents of the post in a P. We'll say publication dot metadata dot um, content, for example. So I think content is the actual field of the post. And the awesome part about this is you can really just put whatever you want and you can see and kind of explore all of the information that's available, like the stats, for example, you could get total amount of likes, total amount of mirrors, total amount of comments with this completely type safe, uh, autocomplete suggestion kind of setup that we spend so much time uh, setting up is providing us with this amazing kind of discoverability of the data available on the actual lens protocol itself. So that's kind of why I wanted to show you all of the steps to set this setup up because now it's so easy for us to build and discover what's available from the data that we're getting back from the hooks and build out these really clean UI components where we're rendering all of the information that we actually want on the kind of UI here. So we'll add some styles for this. We'll say class name is equal to feed post content title. Sure, that sounds good. Class name is equal to stars feed post content description. And we'll add these on the CSS over here. So we'll say dot feed post content title. We'll give that a 24 pixels. Sure, that sounds good to me. Feed post content description. Let's give that a 16 pixels and 400 font weight. That sounds good to me. So then on the kind of stars up here, I don't want this to be gray anymore. I kind of want this to be, um, let's say RGBA uh, zero, zero, I will say 10, 10, 10. Uh, 0 0.9 or something like that. And we'll up this to like 50, 50, 50. And we'll give this a uh, border, uh, one pixel solid black, just to make it look somewhat decent. And maybe we'll lower this a little bit, 30, 30, 30. I'm just kind of get a like lighter dark gray onto the uh, background of the post itself. On the homepage, we'll add a, style to this container. So in home.module.css, we'll add some styles for the uh, container. We can actually just get rid of all this, I'm pretty sure, since we're not using it. So we say dot container, we'll say, um, we want a kind of max width so it doesn't take up the full page. Um, so the container will be the full uh, page and then we'll say uh, posts container. We'll have a wrapper around all of our posts. So this is going to be here. I'll say div class name is equal to styles dot post container. Close that off. And now we can give our container some styles. This is a full page container. And this is going to be display flex, flex direction column, item center, display center. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Nope, I don't want that. Then for the post container, I kind of want a, um, container for all the posts with a max width. So we'll say the display is flex again, flex direction is column, line item center, just by content center, max width 800 pixels. And that looks good to me. So we'll say max width is 800 pixels. And then on the feed post container, we'll say width 100%. Let's say gap between the items is 16 pixels, sure. Sounds good. And you can spend as much time as you like on styles. I'm just kind of skipping over it, giving us some auto-completed suggestions here. And we'll see what that looks like on the UI. Uh, looks decent. Maybe we could add some like text align center. Center. That looks a bit better. We'll have some kind of, uh, maybe make this post content description a little bigger. You can kind of go crazy on uh, what content you want to show and how you want to show it. I'm not gonna show you how to make it styled so nicely. Uh, you can feel free to use the libraries and frameworks that you use 
uh, and are most comfortable with like Tailwind or Material UI, whatever you're most comfortable with to add some styling to your profile and the feeds as well. One thing you might notice is every time you click or kind of click in and click out of the feed, it changes. And that is because React Query by default uh, refetches or revalidates every time you come back to the window. We can disable that behavior inside of the index.tsx here with the uh, configuration options available to the React hook. So we can see all of the options available such as um, revalidate or refetch. Uh, what's it called? Re, let's ask Copilot here. We'll say don't re fetch when the user comes back. And I believe there's a flag, I just can't remember what it's called. So refetch, here we go. Refetch on reconnect, refetch on window focus. We can disable that. We can also disable refetch on uh, reconnect. We can disable that. So now when the user is refocusing the window, such as coming in and out of the uh, homepage here, it shouldn't refetch every time. So I'm clicking in and out, it's no longer uh, refreshing and you can configure that to however you like uh, and go kind of crazy with the configurations in React Query here. What we might wanna do next is on the feed of posts, you might wanna click onto the profile's name and go to that person's profile and see what publications they've made and we'll add some kind of interactivity by following that user as well when you're on the profile. But what we wanna do is we're going to add a link to the user's profile inside of this feed post here. So when you click on the user's name, let's change this from a P tag to a link and we'll import link from next link on line two here, we'll change the P to a link. And this requires us to provide an href. And this is where we're going to use Next.js's dynamic routes. So we're going to use Next.js dynamic routes to create a dynamic page such as this, slash pages slash post slash PID, or in our case, we're gonna do pages slash profile slash profile ID. And this is going to take in a unique identifier. We'll request some information based on that unique identifier. So in our case, we'll request the information about that profile using its profile ID and display a feed of posts created by that user, as well as their profile information, such as their bio, their handle, as well as some interactivity when we add the following capability as well. So we'll use Next.js dynamic routes here. To do that, we can go to the pages directory, create a new folder called profile, for example. So say profile. Within that, we need to create a new file that has square open bracket. We can do ID, close square bracket and dot TSX. And that is the kind of syntax for creating a dynamic route where you go to slash profile slash jaredwatts.lens, for example, and we can grab this jaredwatts.lens value and perform some operations accordingly based on what is that dynamic value. So going back to our link here, where we wanna send users is a dynamic link. So we'll say slash, uh, slash profile. And then here is where we'll use the dollar sign curly bracket symbol to put the user's profile here. So we'll say slash profile slash publication dot profile dot handle. And this is kind of a unique identifier for each user. And we'll be able to access that using the ID of this profile page when we uh, navigate it here. We'll load up the information about that user's profile based on the information available to us in the URL. So here I'm gonna show you how powerful the setup that we have is. So we've made a GraphQL query, I believe, for getting a profile. Actually, it looks like we don't have it. So the step here is you wanna do something on Lens, right? You go to Lens API examples as the first step, go to the source slash GraphQL folder in here. And here's where you'll find all of the GraphQL queries and mutations for anything you want to do on Lens. So for our case, we wanna load up information about a profile. So we'll go to probably something like get profile here. We'll copy this into our uh, project. So we'll create a new folder called get profile.graphql. Get profile.graphql. Paste this in here. And then all we need to do next is run npm run code gen. That is going to grab this new query that we've added, generate a React hook for us that we can use on this new page that we've just created. 
And then we can see that in the generated.ts file, we'll now have a use uh, profile query that accepts uh, what should be a handle, I believe, single profile query request. So we're gonna pass in the handle to load information about the profile. And what we get back from that query is whatever we define inside of this. So we're getting back all of the profile fields, which is a fragment that we've defined in here. So we'll get back ID, name, bio, attributes is followed by me, the follow NFT address, metadata of that user, the handle, the picture, all of this information that we define in the GraphQL files here is what's going to be available from that hook. So now we have all of the kind of data fetching capabilities. We can just continue on and write this kind of front end code inside of this ID.tsx. And that's why I love this setup so much is because all of the GraphQL setup, you can literally just bring in the file, have this data fetching capabilities generated for you. And all you need to do is start to display what information you want on the front end here. So let's begin to write out this code here. We'll say just some boilerplate code. We'll say export default function profile page. And within this, we're going to have again, some kind of boilerplate code. We'll say div last name is equal to styles dot um, profile container or something like that. And within here, we're going to display the user's profile information. So we'll say div class name, profile content, and we'll say profile content container. Within this div, we'll have a placeholder for the profile picture, the cover image. We'll have the profile's name, profile handle, and we'll have the profile description. Beneath the profile content container, let's have another placeholder for um, the publications that this user has. So we'll say class name equals styles.publications styles. I don't want style sheet, publications container. And within here, we'll render out each of the uh, publication feed items again. So we can reuse that feed item component, I think we might need to create a new component, I'm not exactly sure, but what should be available to us is when we load that use publications query, again, we'll be able to use the component that we've created already to render all of those posts on the profile as well. So let's start to write out the styles for this as well. So we'll say, create a new file called uh, profile.module.css and we'll import that in here. So we'll say import styles from uh, styles slash profile dot module CSS. So to get the information about the profile, we can automatically import that query that we just generated with the GraphQL code gen. So we'll say const is loading, uh, rename that to loading profile uh, and data and profile data is equal to use uh, profile query. And within here, we're going to need to pass in the request containing the uh, handle here. So how do we get the handle out of the URL? So we have the URL, which looks something like slash profile slash jaredwatts.lens. How do we get that value out? And this is where Next.js router comes into play. So we'll use the Next.js router reference here, and you can use the use router hook to grab a reference of the router object. And within that, you can grab the path name. So you'll say import uh, use router from next router. And then we'll say const router is equal to use router. And then we can grab the path uh, slash ID uh, field from the URL. And then we can pass that to the use profile query. So say grab the path URID. So from router.query, we'll say const ID is equal to router.query. And then we can pass the ID in here. And ID represents this kind of value that we've named the file here. So ID is the dynamic value. We grab the ID field out of router.query. So if we named this um, in brackets profile ID, for example, then this would change to profile ID that you're grabbing out of the React, uh, sorry, out of the router query here. So whatever you name the file is whatever value you can destructure from the router query here. 
So let's send that to the use profile query. We now have the handle, which is our lens handle. For example, jaredwatts.lens. This will give us back the profile data. So let's, for example, console log this, console.log uh, loading profile and profile data. And we'll take a look at that on the URL here. So if we go to slash, or maybe we can actually test this out and click on one of these. So crypto TV, for example, this takes us to crypto TV 5.lens. This then prints out in the console here. Uh, I'll just give you a quick refresh so you can actually see it. Um, it prints out the uh, loading profile false. Profile data is available when that comes back. Seems to be an issue here that says cannot query without profile IDs or handle defined. And that might be because ID was undefined at first. So maybe let's say don't fire this until um, the ID is available. So let's say enabled is equal to bang bang ID. So that should get rid of that error for us. Quickly refresh this. So loading profile is true, loading profile true. When loading profile is false, we get the data back and we can see the information about this person's profile, such as their bio, their picture, their statistics, how many followers and things like that they have, all generated by that automatically created React hook for us. Again, we want the information about this user's publications. So this flow kicks off again. We have a desire to display something on our application. We look up the API examples provided by Lens. So for example, uh, let's search for publications in this folder here. We can do getpublications.graphql and we can copy and paste this into our project. So this is going to get the publications for a request. So let's create a new GraphQL file called get-publications dot ts, sorry, dot um, GraphQL here. And let's paste that query in. Let's again run step two, which is npm run code gen. This is going to detect this new file, generate an output into generated.ts. And now if we look up use, um, use publications, it should be called, use publications query is automatically generated for us. So that's how awesome this flow is. Whenever you need new data, you can literally just copy and paste whatever you need in, generate it, and it's automatically available for you. So now if we go to the profile page, we can then say a similar thing to say console, uh, sorry, not console, we'll say const is loading, rename that to is loading publications this time, get the data out, we'll say data, publications data, just rename these variables to be a bit more meaningful. And we'll say is equal to use publications query. And for this, we pass in the request. We can press control space to see what's available. Request. And here's all of the filters that we can have based on this GraphQL query. For us, I believe we just care about um, profile ID. So for us, profile ID is going to be the users profile ID, which we can get from profile data dot uh, profile dot ID. And here's where React query is even more powerful. You can see we used whenever the ID becomes available last time. Now we have this dependent query where we need the profile data before we can trigger this publications data. And in our example, this was exactly what we were trying to do. We're getting the posts and then the publications Sorry, we're getting the post and then the profile. This example, our publications depends on this query being run. So we can then say in here, enabled is equal to, we need the ID of the profile to be present to make this query. So say, when you run this query, make sure the profile ID is available before you run that. So we'll say profile data dot profile dot ID. And we'll say bang, bang. That has to be available before you run this query. And uh, let's see here, profile.profileID, so profile.profileID, looks happy with us, excellent. So now we can see profile data loading profile, and then let's also include publications data and is loading publications, and console log that into the console here. So what we'll see now, if we refresh the page, we'll see first the um, profiles is loading and publications is loading, when profiles is loading becomes false, then is loading publications is true still. 
We then kick off the query to get the publications once the profile is available. So we see here, loading publications is true, true. And then when they both come back, loading profile is false, loading publications is false, and we have profile data and we have information about the publications that this profile has made. That's why I love React Query so much and I'm super happy if you haven't learned about this before to be showing it to you. It uh, is amazing to use this tool. It feels so good as a developer to not have to worry about managing your own errors or managing loading states. It's probably my favorite library that I've discovered uh, in the history of being a developer. And now, for example, if we go to nada.lens, you can see we'll load up Nada's profile since we're grabbing this dynamic value using Next.js dynamic routes. We then load Nada's profile. So we have Nada Dabit, here's his develop director of developer relations as his bio, his publications that he's made onto the Lens protocol, all available here. Whatever your profile you put in here, let's say Jared Watts.lens, it's going to load information about that profile. And you might be wondering if we put some gibberish in here, let's say blah, 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 blah. Then what's going to happen is we're going to likely get an error here. So we might want to say, grab the error out of the use profile query. So we'll say error, profile error, and we'll say error, publications error. And on the UI, we can say if there's an error, uh, so if error, um, if publications error or uh, profile error, then we'll return. Uh, let's just say couldn't find find this profile, and we'll return that on the UI. Couldn't could not find this profile. So we take a look at the UI now. This will retry a couple of times to make sure it's not just doing something wrong. And then finally it says, uh, we couldn't find it. We tried three or four times or however many times you configure it. And it says, okay, here's the actual error. Then when you refocus on the window, it's gonna try again and you can configure this to your liking. Whenever I click back onto this window from exiting the page, it's gonna retry and retry and retry. And then it says, okay, finally, here's what the error was. So you can see it's literally making one request, two requests, three requests, four requests. If it can't do it after four requests, okay, something about this query is wrong. Here's the actual error. So another awesome feature about React Query is its ability to retry. And then once it's definitely not working, here's the actual error. And you can easily display that on the UI. So now if we want to actually build out this page, we can have the error state here. We can have the loading state. We can say if loading profile, we'll show a quick little loading screen. And of course, feel free to add any styles and customizations you want. This is just an example of kind of a bare bones uh, without styling it. So here we can see loading profile. When that profile comes back, we reach this state, which is where we're going to use the information from the profile data to actually be rendered on the UI. So here we're going to have a kind of cover image and I'm gonna open up the CSS file here. Uh, did we make one? Yeah, we did, profile.module.css. So I'll quickly open that on this sort of split here. And we're gonna have a div with the class name of styles.cover image container. We're going to use the media renderer component again to pass in the media, which is equal to profile data dot profile dot cover picture. And if they don't have one, we'll just pass in an empty string. You could pass in kind of default value for the cover photo if you choose to do so. I'm just keeping it simple here again. So the alt is going to be profile data dot profile dot name, or we'll have profile data dot profile dot uh, handle. So that's going to be the alt text of the image. We'll then have some styling with class name of styles of cover image, and we'll close that off and we'll close the div tag off as well. So the media, <clears throat> it's not called media, sorry, it's called source is what it's complaining about. So this is going to be either the cover picture, and this is going to be uh, dot uh, original dot URL. So this again is just a little type issue. I'm not sure why that is not being detected, but maybe we can look at that and go back and fix it. So that is gonna give us the cover image. For example, if we go to my cover picture profile here, uh, cover picture dot original dot URL uh, is not happy. So let's see profile dot cover picture dot original dot URL. Let's see what's being printed out here. So we have profile data 
and we have profile dot cover picture is null. Okay, so I don't have a cover picture. I guess we could fall back to kind of show uh, the actual picture itself maybe, or we could just show some kind of random cover picture. Uh, maybe we could say if there is a cover image, then let's show that. So we'll say if the profile data dot profile dot cover picture dot original dot URL. And, and then in that case, if we do have a profile, sorry, a cover picture, then we'll render this div. If we don't, then we won't render anything. And let's move that up here as well. Again, not sure why the original URL is not being uh, detected here. Uh, seems to be okay. So if we go to, for example, nader.lens, we should be able to see the cover picture loaded here, there we go. Okay, cool. So the cover picture is loading, we need some styles, but beneath that, we're going to show the profile picture. So again, we're going to say, if there's a profile picture on the profile dot um, profile picture, picture, you can see in the data that gets printed out here, we have profile dot picture dot original dot URL. So we're gonna say profile picture dot original dot URL. Again, not sure why the types are not cooperating here, but we can just ignore that for now. We're gonna say, if that exists, we're going to render another media renderer. So we're gonna say media renderer, and the source is going to be profile data dot profile <coughs> dot profile dot picture dot original dot URL. We'll have the alt text is equal to the profile name or the profile handle or an empty string and then we'll have a class name of type profile picture and we'll close this off again. We'll quickly just wrap this in a div to say div class name is equal to the styles of profile picture container. So we're gonna add some styles to the wrapper around this as well. We'll just close this off here. So again, we'll add that TS ignore. Don't know why that keeps happening with the uh, profile picture original URL, but that's okay. We can just add this little flag to ignore it for now. So now on the profile picture, you can see on the profile page, so you can see the cover image here and you can see the profile picture here. You should be able to see that on my profile as well. If I go to jaredwatts.lens, you should be able to see I don't have a cover image. <laughs> I do have a massive picture of my face rendering here. So we're just gonna add some style so that make sure it looks uh, a bit more reasonable. We'll then have a H1 tag to render the profile name. So add a class name of profile.name. We'll say profile dot data dot profile dot name, otherwise unknown, unknown user or a non user maybe a bit more clean. And then we can say close that h1 tag off beneath the profile tag we will have a p tag containing the users handle. So we'll say p uh, class name is equal to styles dot profile handle we will then render the profile dot profile data dot profile dot handle or a non-user, for example. And then finally, we're going to render the profile description. So let's just say profile data dot profile dot bio, for example. Let's say bio, and we'll close this off here. Cool, so now if we add some styling, let's just say, uh, whoops, made that a bit too big. The styling we need is profile container. So first one is the actual full container. So we'll say this is dot profile container. This is going to be a flex box. So we'll say display flex, flex direction column, center, center, blah, 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 blah. Looks good to me. Then within that we'll have dot profile content container. And here is the wrapper around our cover image, a profile picture, and the, where does this div actually end? Uh, all of this. So this contains uh, all of the information about the profile. So the profile name, profile handle, all of this. So this is gonna be another flex box. There's gonna be display flex. And we'll do flex direction column, align item center, justify content center. We'll just see what that looks like uh, in a second. We don't have to go too into depth. Again, you can feel free to bring your own styles. I don't wanna go uh, and make <laughs> a bunch of CSS if you wanna use uh, your own styling framework. So that's why I'm not going too deep into this. And we'll add some styles for the cover image. So let's say, um, we'll say width 100% height and we'll say object fit is equal to cover. 
So that will stretch it around uh, 256 pixels and I'll make it 100% width of the parent, which we should say is maybe uh, max width of 800 pixels or something like that. And then the profile picture, uh, which is down here. So we have styles.profilepicture container. We'll then add like a, um, yeah, we'll make it 120 wide, 128 tall, and we'll give it a circular uh, radius. So that's gonna be that. The media renderer should fit to the constraints of the parent. We'll see if that actually does. Profile name should be good, profile handle. Let's give that a style, say profile handle. And this can just be uh, opacity, maybe a bit lighter. So opacity is 0.7 or something like that. So let's check out what that looks like. So we have <laughs> not the best looking uh, profile here, but let's see, we have, I don't think we actually need these kind of containers. So if we get rid of this container and just give this class name here, give this class name here, get rid of the div, get rid of the div, get rid of the div, and get rid of the div here. See if that makes a difference. Yeah, there we go, that looks a lot better. So just getting rid of the divs, wrapping the media renderers and styling those with the um, the width and heights that we defined in the CSS file here. So you can see we have the handle, let's add a quick at in front of that. So we have the title, which is the user's name. We have the handle of the lens profile. We have the bio beneath that. We could maybe add some things like even how many followers they have. So we could say um, P, let's say profile data dot profile dot stats dot total followers. That looks good. And let's say empty space between that and say followers. So then this uh, profile has 7,343 followers and this is going to just add some padding on top of that. So follow account margin top. Uh, 32 pixels and we'll add that to the profile class name is equal to stars dot follow account. Cool. So that didn't seem to work, did it? Uh, margin top 32 pixels. Huh. Doesn't seem to be, there we go. Okay. Just a little bit laggy. Cool. So then we have 7,343 followers. You can see all of the information available on the actual profile itself and you can feel free to display. I don't think we need this border. It looks a bit silly. Feel free to display any of the information you want from the profile. But what we're going to do next is display some of the information about the actual publications that we loaded from the second query here for the use publications query hook. So for this, we should be able to map and iterate over each of the uh, items within this publications data field that we have here. So let's say we can close, oh, we'll just shrink this a little bit over here. And within this, we're going to open up some curly brackets to say, let's iterate, iterate over the items in the publications array. So we're going to say publications data dot publications dot items dot map and we'll iterate again over all of the publications and return something within these brackets. So essentially all we're doing is for each publication, transform that publication into whatever we put into these brackets here. So what we're going to do is try and see if this feed post component accepts our publication here. And we'll add a key, so say publication.id. Hopefully it's happy with us here. So we can then go onto the profile page and Awesome, we can see all of the posts that are made by Nader. So let's actually just move this into the div above so we can have that max width of 800 constraint so it doesn't take up the full screen. And let's add some kind of padding between the follow account. So we'll add a margin bottom to the follow account here. So margin bottom, 32 pixels or 128 pixels, make it a bit bigger. Uh, maybe a bit too big, 32 pixels seems good. So here's all of the posts that Nader has made. Um, it doesn't look like there's any images on these posts as you can see. So it's just the, oh, there's an image. So it is working as we expect. So all of the text, all of the media that's associated with these images are being displayed. What might be cool to do is in the feed item or feed post component is have a kind of header section. If we open up the CSS here, we'll have a footer that displays the stats of each post. So we'll say feed post footer. And this will be display, sorry, you can't see, move it over, display flex. 
and flex direction row, and we'll do a gap um, 16 pixels between each of the items within that flex box. And then beneath this div here, we'll have a div saying class name equals styles.feedpostfooter. And within here, we'll have a P tag that says, um, first we'll do, um, I believe we could do mirrors. Oh, let's actually take a look at what we can access within this. We say publication dot stats dot total amount of collects. So let's add that and we'll say collects. Then we'll copy paste this two more times. We'll say total amount of comments, rename that to comments and total amount of mirrors. And we'll rename that to mirrors, close that div off and take a look at what that looks like on the UI. So, oh, it's in a, uh, why is it in a column here? That's interesting. I would expect that to be <laughs> in a, um, a row as I defined, which is very interesting. Uh, why is that not in a row? Let's take a quick look at the CSS here. Uh, so the div doesn't have any styles. So feed post footer. Oh, we haven't saved this file. Okay, there we go. So zero collect, zero comments, zero mirrors on these. And it does look like it's working. So five comments, two mirrors, zero, two, one, one. It looks good. So there's probably some work we could do with the font, but uh, as I said, this styles doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just kind of showing what data you can display. So we have the profile image being pulled from IPFS for each of the posts that is automatically rendered using the IPFS media renderer. We're then rendering the actual title of the post. And then this section here is the contents of that post. So in a social media feed app, you might not even want to render the title as it's going to be uh, defaulted to just be comment by that handle or post by that handle or mirror by that handle. And sometimes the title is not actually necessarily relevant. So you could filter down even to what kind of posts you want to include in the index.tsx query here. So in this page, you can see the use explore publications query, you can somewhere in here, define which uh, filters I believe you want inside of the request. So let's say inside of the request, you can add a limit, you can add filters within this metadata, I believe it is. So you can see inside of here, you could add a filter for what kinds of content you wanna focus on. So if you only want articles or if you only want um, main content, what do we put here? Uh, what's the required filter? publication of main focus, main focus dot uh, audio, embed image link text only video. You could filter down to specific kinds of posts. You can filter down to specific tags or um, filter down different uh, content warnings and things like that. So you can add any kinds of criteria that you want to the actual request as well and customize the feed to however you choose to. So if we refresh the page, we get the loading profile screen we load in the profile and then the publications appear here. Maybe we could add a quick loading state on the profile to say while that information is loading. So we'll say is loading publications, return a div that says loading publications, close that div off. Otherwise we'll continue on with this logic here. So now when we refresh, we'll add this loading state here. So we get loading profile and then quickly get loading profile uh, publications, but since that is already cached, it comes back super, super quickly because of React Query out of the box. From this page, there's currently no way to get back to the feed. So what we can do is in the components folder, let's create a new header component. So header.tsx and we'll add some boilerplate code again. And what we're going to do within this file is we'll just have a div that is always at the top of the page. So we're going to have a div with some styles. So we'll create a new styles again. So we'll say header.module.css. We'll import these styles here, import styles from uh, dot dot slash uh, styles slash header.module.css. It's going to have no props, so we can just get rid of that. And what we'll do here is open up the styles on the right again, and we'll just say dot header container and what we'll do is we'll have a set height of 64 pixels we'll have a uh, display of flex flex direction is row we'll align the item center we'll justify the content space between so then we'll set this to class name is styles.header container and we'll close that uh, down here so then we'll have a div 
that we can just represent with our logo. So let's uh, image source logo, sounds good. And this is going to be a link around this. We'll say link, import that from next link. And we'll wrap our logo in a link that links back to the homepage. So we'll say href is slash, which takes us back to the index.tsx page. And we'll close the div off here. So that's the left side. The right side uh, can be the sign-in button. So we're going to add this sign-in button into the header. And this is going to flex out since it's justify content space between the link to the logo uh, to the homepage rather will be on the left side. The sign in button will be on the right side here. So if we take a look, I don't actually think we have a file called logo.png. So maybe let's quickly just drag a picture into the public folder here. So let's navigate to the public folder and here's where we can put in the logo. Let's just put in the gorilla emoji and set that to our logo.png. And when we click the gorilla in our header here, uh, it won't actually be rendered yet. So if we go to the underscore app.tsx page, remember when we said any content that we put inside of this file will be rendered on every page. So we can say header and place that directly into the uh, query client provider above the component. And then that's going to be rendered <laughs> every time we visit any page. So let's fix this up a little bit and make the header a bit cleaner. So we'll say uh, the logo has a style of height 64, margin left 16, that looks good. So we'll say class name, it's equal to styles.logo. And this is linking back to the homepage. We don't even need the div here. We can just render the link directly. The sign in button looks all good to me. So now let's make this a bit smaller so it actually works. So then we click the gorilla, we go back to the homepage, we get the feed again. We'll do dot right and margin or right can be 16 pixels as well. We'll give this right side a bit of padding. So say div class name is equal to styles dot right. So that's just going to push it out inwards a little bit. So now we can connect our wallet on any page. We want this to be fixed at the top. So let's say position um, fixed, I believe is what we want. Uh, fixed and let's say top zero, left zero, uh, width 100% or something like that. I think that's what we want. Yep. And then margin bottom should be 64 pixels. And let's add a background color of, let's say I want a dark gray color. Let's say dark slate gray, margin uh, border bottom can be a one pixel solid white. So that looks pretty <laughs> terrible <laughs> again, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, an example of how you can get the header and the connect wallet button to show up on each of the pages. So now when we navigate to this person's profile, we can go back to the uh, homepage by clicking on our logo here. This will take us back to the homepage and load up the feed again, and we can navigate around the application now using this header component. We can also sign in directly from the homepage. You can see our profile is now displayed in the top right corner. What we could do, which might be cool, is actually render the image of our profile. So instead of saying, hello, Jared, what's up lens? What we could do is say, use the media renderer component to add our image. So let's say source is profile query, query dot data dot default profile dot picture dot original dot URL or an empty string. And then the alt can be our name and the style, let's just hard code it here, is width of 48, height 48, water radius is 50%. So let's close this off. And it's not happy with us because we're missing a comma. So now we can add our profile picture at the top right of our lens profile and we're good to go. Again, the styling is pretty bad, but that's not the purpose of this video. I'm just trying to show you how you can kind of use the data setup that we have available to um, kind of navigate around and put whatever data you want on the screen, wherever you want to use it. And so you can now click on the homepage that will take you back to the feed. And if you click on Elon tweet lens, for example, then you can go to that person's profile and view their uh, profile information and their feed. Looks like we need some kind of gap between the header 
add the content here. Um, so let's see what's going wrong here. I think we might just hack it a little bit and inside of our header, let's add a div between the content and the header. So let's wrap this in an empty tag and let's add a div that is the height of the header here. So let's say style is equal to height, 64 pixels and close that div off. So that just adds an empty uh, kind of container here. And that way we can get rid of the margin bottom 64 and that will look a bit better. So this is now, uh, we might need to add a Z index here. So let's say Z index is equal to nine, 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 nine. Just put it at the top always. And now our header is above our content and you can actually see the content that's not hidden behind the header now. And this is just, again, an example of the kind of stuff that you can do. The styling is obviously pretty bad. You would want to use your own styling framework and I'm just using some basic CSS to kind of get the point across. Before we dive into interacting with the smart contracts, such as following users and creating posts, there's again, some background knowledge of the way we're going to do it and why it's designed this way. And I've hopefully done my best to kind of summarize a few different topics into this section here, where we're going to look at an example code from the Lens API examples repository here for following a user. And at first this is pretty intimidating, but hopefully this section will kind of clarify what's happening. I'm going to outline how the EIP 712 proposal here is kind of working in parallel with the Lens Hub dispatcher and the broadcaster. So if we take a look at the source code, what we're doing is we're first calling this create follow typed data function. So inside of the follow function, we have step one is to log in, obviously. So you need to be logged in to actually create or, or follow someone on Lens. Step two is to create this follow typed data. And that is creating a message that the user is going to sign. The reason we're doing this follow typed data and what that actually means is we're creating a message that follows this EIP 712 standard for type structured data hashing and signing. So previously, you would have to send the user a kind of byte string and ask them to sign it. And if we take a look at the screenshots of this proposal, you can see previously this is what it would look like inside of your MetaMask. It's just a big long hash of kind of numbers and letters. And that's what you would have to sign as a user. And on a mainnet environment with a wallet that you're interacting with that you care about, you generally don't want to sign these transactions and have kind of a risk of signing a message that you have no idea what it is. The proposal here of EIP 712, which was uh, a couple of years ago now, so about five-ish years ago, it looks like, was to have a standard where you could create this sign typed data to show up inside of your wallet and have more kind of detailed information about what you're actually going to sign rather than just this raw byte string here. So you can see in this example here, you get the domain, you get the URL, the contract, and kind of some more detailed information of what the actual message you're signing is. So it's not just uh, you know a Hail Mary attempt of just signing some random message. So this is what the 712 standard is. And with every kind of, well, not with every, but with a lot of the right transactions such as follow, create post, comment, and mirror, and things like that, you follow this three-step standard where you create that signed type data to ask the user to sign it. So this is the message that you're generating. Lens exposes these APIs to get the kind of structure of these um, 712 compatible messages, right? So in their blog post here, it's describing what the purpose of these API endpoints are, where you have specific API endpoints on the Lens GraphQL API to generate these typed data uh, fields or messages that come back to you so the user can sign them. So it says here, typed data is a newish way to show users what they're signing. You can read more about what we were just looking at here. Constructing all the data parameters is normally quite hard and can get out of date quite fast with the speed at which transactions occur. On the type data, you need to get the nonce, the deadline, the contract version, contract address, chain ID, and the contract for the signature, blah, 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 blah. 
essentially what it's saying is it's really hard to actually create these sign messages yourself. So we've made these uh, endpoints on the GraphQL server for you to actually get those kind of structured data back. And you can kind of pass in these human readable uh, function calls and get what you need back from the lens so that you can pass that and ask the user to sign it in the next step. So first step, you ask lens, hey, can you give me this kind of message that I'm gonna show to my user so they can sign it? Second step is to ask the user to actually sign that typed data message from their wallet. And then you send that signature to the smart contract. So here we're saying, call the follow with sig function on the lens hub smart contract, pass in the details of the signature that we just generated from the user signing that message that we created from the lens API. And we send some kind of uh, other information along with that function call as well. If you take a look at the actual smart contract itself, we'll see this follow with sig function here, where you can see we need to zoom in quickly here. You can see we need to pass in a function called follow with sig, and we need to provide a um, set of parameters into this function called uh, data types dot follow with sig data. And this is coming from a different smart contract provided by lens called data types.sol. So if we take a look in this file, we should be able to see follow with sig data. We need to provide the address of the follower. We need to provide an array of profile IDs, the bytes for the datas of the arbitrary data to pass, blah, blah, blah. We need to provide the signature. And if we look up this signature in the file as well, we'll be able to find what we need to provide for this one. So you can see how it's kind of getting super complicated um, of what we actually need to provide. If I can find this quickly, uh, here it is. So we need to provide the signatures recovery parameter, the R parameter, the S parameter, the signatures deadline. To be honest, I am a bit out of my depth at this point of what we're actually sending to the smart contract here. The point is it's very complicated to actually generate what you need to send to the smart contract to perform a follow transaction. Lens has exposed these APIs. We call the API to get the message back, ask the user to sign it, send that signature to the uh, smart contract, and that kind of abstracts away the complexity of generating these uh, parameters required to actually follow someone on Lens. You might be wondering why the function is called follow with sig and not just follow, or for example, comment with sig and not just comment. The reason is you can actually call follow uh, and it is its own separate function. So for example, here is the raw function just called follow and you can pass in the profile IDs that you're following and the uh, call data stuff that we saw in the previous function. And this is going to call the follow function on the smart contract. The reason is every time you interact with a smart contract that performs a write operation, your wallet needs to uh, approve the transaction and pay for the gas fees for that to go onto the blockchain. Every time you write information to the blockchain, you pay the gas fee for that information to um, kind of be mined or be stored onto the blockchain, whatever the uh, consensus mechanism is for that blockchain. We don't need to go too much into depth for that. You're probably already used to uh, accepting a transaction and then having to pay for the gas, wait for the transaction to go through, and then you can kind of continue. This architecture is not suitable for social media apps where you wouldn't want to like a post, approve the transaction to like the post, and then wait for the transaction to go approve and then continue on the social media application. That's not a good user experience and Lens has created a kind of two part solution to address this uh, requirement to pay gas fees every time you want to uh, perform a write operation on the smart contract. So there is the opportun opportunity to uh, call the follow function directly, but I'll jump into why we will use this signature method uh, rather than just call these functions directly. So to address this gas problem, uh, Lens has created a kind of two-step solution. One is the broadcast transaction, and the second one is the dispatcher. The broadcast transaction is essentially a mechanism for Lens to pay for the gas fees rather than the user pay for the gas fees of the transaction. So instead of the user um, approving a transaction, they'll sign a message that says, hey, do you want this to happen? That will go to Lens's kind of relay a wallet and they'll pay for the gas cost of that information to go to the blockchain. 
This still requires you to sign a message every time you wanna do something. So every time you wanna create a post, you'll sign a message. You don't pay any gas fees for that message. You still have to sign something from your wallet. You can take this a step further with the dispatcher. So with the dispatcher, you can kind of see what we've just talked about and why this was designed to kind of address the uh, core concepts of the blockchain technology and why it's not suitable for social media apps. You don't want to have to approve a transaction or sign a message every time you want to do something. So this introduces the dispatcher. It says basically it is an intermediate wallet with funds that acts as a signer for every transaction. We only have to delegate signing privileges to this dispatcher, which operates hidden in the back end. This is combined with an optimistic UI and creates a seamless experience identical to what we are used to in kind of the Web2 world with Twitter and Facebook and other social media applications where you don't have to sign anything for an action to happen. What this means is you can sign a transaction or a message that says, I approve the dispatcher to uh, sign messages on my behalf. And it says, the user here says, hey, can I set the dispatcher? Application asks you to sign a message to say, do you really wanna uh, set the dispatcher for this kind of approval situation on your account? That goes back to the application, which sends it to the dispatcher. So you'll send the transaction that comes back. After this flow has kind of uh, finalized, you then no longer even have to sign messages from your account. So you don't have to approve transactions and now you don't even have to sign anything. You just kind of interact with it as you would with any Web2 application where you would just say post or mirror or comment or do some kind of write action that goes to the application. Application handles sending that to the dispatcher and the dispatcher handles writing that to the blockchain and sending that information back to you. The last part of this sentence uh, where we're describing an optimistic UI creates a seamless user experience is describing this kind of behavior where uh, I believe it's in the sentence here. It says optimistic means we assume the transaction will come through. So we don't need to wait for validators to reach a consensus. So in kind of uh, simpler terms, it means they're not actually waiting for that transaction to be complete and written to the blockchain uh, in that kind of immutable state. They're saying, hey, we kind of trust this is actually going to go through and they do some kind of validation on the uh, API endpoints that we're going to request to make sure the data you're sending actually makes any sense at all. And then we optimistically say, hey, that transaction's probably gonna go through most of the time. And then we can continue on as a user to say, I just clicked this button to create a post or follow someone or whatever. And you don't have to wait 20, 30 seconds for that transaction to actually be validated onto the blockchain. You can kind of just continue on as you would in any Web2 application. Further down on this page, it says, uh, you can use any function that uses with SIG, so follow with SIG or create uh, with SIG or whatever we're doing to send to either the broadcaster or to the dispatcher. So that's why we're going to use this with SIG methodology because if you do want to add a gasless experience with either uh, the broadcaster or the dispatcher, you are going to be able to use any with SIG function to send that along to that gasless experience rather than just using the, let's say, follow function by itself. You can do that in the section down here, but it says pretty much you'll need to do everything yourself. Uh, the API is not going to validate that for you and it's just not going to be as easy as the method we're going to use in this video. So in your applications, when you're building them out, hopefully it looks a bit more understandable of what's happening inside of these uh, TypeScript functions where you have this process of creating the type data, signing the type data, you get the signature back. Sometimes you have to do these things where you split the signature or manipulate the signature in some way. So you're sending that to the smart contract function. But in general, it's a three-step process. Get this from the Lens API, sign it, and then send that to actually perform the action on the smart contract. And if you remember inside of our diagram somewhere up here, while back, we're going to send this from our application to the smart contract up here. This will get indexed by the Web2 stack and then will be available to read through the GraphQL API. Awesome, so now let's begin to add the follow uh, function capability into our application. So as always, the first step of doing anything with this setup that we have is go to the source GraphQL folder in here and we'll want to follow, uh, create some follow mutation on the Lens GraphQL API. So we'll go to the GraphQL folder, we'll search for follow 
and here we go, follow.graphql, and this is a mutation called create follow type data. So that's the first step is to get the typed data that we need to ask the user to sign it and then send that signature to the smart contract. So we'll copy this into our project, create a new folder called, or a new file, sorry, called uh, follow.graphql. Then the next step is paste that in and run the npm run code gen command here. So we'll say npm run code gen. That's going to create a React query mutation hook inside of our generated.ts folder. So it'll be called create follow type data mutation, uh, create follow type data mutation. Here we go. So use create follow type data mutation and this sends the request to the Lens GraphQL API for the uh, signed message or the signed type data that we need to ask the user to sign and then send that to the smart contract. So let's go ahead and create our hook inside of the lib folder here. Let's say use follow.ts and this is going to be a hook that we can call uh, to follow a user and that's going to kick off that three-step process. So we're gonna say one, use the auto-generated mutation called, uh, what did we call it? Use create follow typed data to, um, to get the uh, typed data for the user to sign. Two is ask the user to sign that type data. Three is send the typed data to the smart contract to perform the write operation on the blockchain. So let's wrap our actual function here. So we say export function use follow and put our comments inside of these curly brackets here. So we said the first step was to use the auto generated mutation called use create follow type data, get the type data back for the user to sign. So what we'll do is we'll say const mutate async. So we'll get the asynchronous function out of this use create follow type data hook. So we'll say use uh, use create, and we'll go ahead and import this. So use create follow type data from the GraphQL generated here. And we'll call that hook. So now this mutate async is a function that asks the Lens GraphQL server to give us the type data for following someone when we provide it with a specific parameters. So we can rename this to say request typed data from the Lens API. And when we call this function now, we can actually specify the request, which is of type follow request. So I'll show you what that looks like. So what we'll do is we'll create an async function called follow. And within this follow function, we're gonna accept a user ID as a parameter, which is of type string. And that represents which ID, uh, sorry, which user we're actually going to follow. So what we're gonna do here is to say, step one is to actually call this hook. So we'll say, ask lens for the type data and store that in a variable. So we'll say const type data equal to await request type data, which is this function that we just got from the hook here. Pass the request into here. And within this request, we need to provide an array of follows because you can actually follow multiple people at once. So this is going to be an array of objects which contains a profile, which is the ID of the user that we're going to follow. So we're gonna say user ID is what we're passing into this request here. So now you can see within this typed data, it's of create follow typed data mutation. What we can get from this is typed data, whoops, typed data dot create follow type data. And you can see we actually have the type data here and the more kind of metadata type information of the message itself as well. So let's just get rid of that for now. We now have a follow function that stores this kind of step one here. I'm gonna move these comments down, I think more appropriate above this line. So we'll say step two is ask the user to sign that typed data. Now the ThoughtWeb SDK has a special function for you to sign uh, EIP 712 compatible messages. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say const SDK is equal to use SDK. So we're gonna import the ThoughtWeb SDK from the React package here. And then the message that we're going to use or the function that we're going to use is called sdk.wallet. And hopefully my autocomplete helps me out here. Uh, sign typed data. And you can see this uh, accepts a domain of EIP 712 domain, the types and a message. So you can see exactly what we need to pass in here 
inside of the API examples, if I can bring it over. If we remember, we needed to sort of manipulate the message a little bit when we followed someone. So we go to follow.ts. We needed to perform this kind of uh, split signature so we can get the V, R, and S variables out of the signature, which is what we were looking at when we were inspecting the smart contract source code. And we send that along to the actual uh, function call on the smart contract. So we need to kind of write these helper functions and sort of manipulate them into the right format for the smart contract to accept. So we're gonna go ahead and write some helper functions to help us handle these signed messages ready for the smart contract now. In the official Lens API examples, you can actually dive into this sign typed data kind of helper function here, and you'll see that it's performing this omit of type name. What that means is when we get information back from um, GraphQL, we can see create follow type data mutation contains information called type name. And we don't want this because it's not really information that we're sending to the smart contract. So we say create follow type data also has type name. If we go to type data, that also has type name. We could send the necessary values that we have here, like domain types and value, but these also have these weird kind of type name variables associated with them. So it's a very GraphQL specific problem. What we're going to do to handle that is use the same method that the Lens API example uses, which is called omit. That uses a library called omit deep, which removes a kind of field from a nested object. So it's going to remove type name from here. It's going to remove type name from here. And that way we can pass the uh, sign message without these unnecessary kind of fields that uh, cause problems when we're sending the typed uh, data with this random kind of type name variable alongside it that doesn't match the format of the EIP 712 standard. On the omit deep page, you can see kind of what it does. So we have an object that is nested that contains B in the top object, contains B in the nested object and contains B in the nested nested object. If you say omit deep B as the key, removes the B key from all of the kind of levels of nesting uh, in this nested object here. So we're gonna remove type name from each of the uh, levels of nesting inside of our object. So to do that, we're going to run npm install or yarn add the omit deep uh, library here. So we're gonna say yarn add omit deep. And I believe we also want some type safety as well. So we're gonna add uh, a dev dependency for TypeScript here. So we're going to say um, yarn add types when we get this uh, message that complains. So for example, if we import omit from omit deep here, say import omit from omit deep, this is then going to say, couldn't find a type de declaration file. So what we're going to do is we're going to say at types slash omit deep. So we'll say yarn add dash capital D, or if you're using NPM, it'll be NPM install dash dash save dev, uh, the at type slash omit deep library here. And that's just going to work well with TypeScript so that we don't need to get this weird uh, kind of error message when we import this library now. So you can see it's gone green. TypeScript is once again happy and now we're ready to write these helper functions. So let's remove the omit deep from this file and we'll create a new file called helpers.ts inside of our lib folder. And if we take a look at the example, we need one for signing the type data and omitting that type name value. And we need another one for splitting the signature. So let's write two of those. We'll say one, uh, sign typed data with omitted type name values using omit deep. And we use another helper function called uh, split the signature to extract the V R and S values. And you can kind of recall what we were looking at in the smart contract source code. We need these V, R, and S values to actually pass in as parameters to the signature parameter um, of the smart contract function. So that's why we need this function here. And we'll use the uh, omit deep library and the SDK to perform the sign type data function here. So we'll say, first let's create a function called uh, omit the signed uh, the type name. So let's say export function omit type name. And this is going to accept any kind of object. We'll just say any as the type and we'll return omit deep and we'll import that on line one here. 
omit deep. And the first parameter to this function is the actual object that you're manipulating. So we'll pass in the object and the field that we want to omit or the keys to omit is underscore underscore type name. And that needs to be an array, sorry. So we'll just put that in an array. So these are the keys that we're going to omit from all the kind of levels of nesting. So then beneath this, we're going to write a function called uh, sign typed data with omitted type name. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. And what we're gonna do within this function is we're going to accept the ThrowUp SDK. So we'll say the first parameter is the SDK of type third web SDK. Import that from at ThrowUp dev slash SDK. The second thing we wanna uh, accept is the domain, which is an EIP 712 domain here. We'll import that from the ThrowUp SDK as well. The third value we want is the types. And this is all coming from, uh, if we take a look at the type data here, you can see this is all the information available on the typed data field. So we have type data dot create follow type data dot uh, type data. And you can see we have the domain, which is the EIP 712. We have the types, we have the values. So these are the three uh, values we're kind of passing into this function here. So for the types, we're gonna say record is equal to a type of string and any. And finally, we have the message or the value, let's say record and again, string and any. So this is where we're going to perform the sign type data using the SDK. So we're going to say const result equal to await SDK dot wallet dot sign typed data. And the three parameters in here, we need to provide the domain. So we're going to say omit uh, type name, pass in domain, and we'll cast this as the expected uh, type here. So we're expecting EIP 712 domain. And then the same thing for the types, so we're gonna say emit type name of types as record string any. And again, omit type name of value as record string any. And we'll convert this to an async function. So we'll say export async function. And then we'll actually, we don't even need to um, return or store this result. We'll just say return await sign type data. So now when we call this function, we sign the type data with all of this kind of it's a little bit hacky as casting it as these values, but it is kind of what we can get out of this omit deep and get these kind of type safeties for the signing of the type messages. So now we kind of have step one where we get the type data. We can then sign the type data using this function. And the final thing we need is the split function. So we're going to say export function split signature. This is going to accept a signature of type string and the ethers library actually has a built-in utility function to perform this. So we'll say ethers, import ethers on line three here. And we'll say ethers.utils.split signature and pass in the signature as the parameter here. And we'll return this value. Cool, so now we've imported the throw of SDK. We have the type of EIP 712 domain. We have ethers and omit deep. And we have all of these helper functions that we can use inside of this use follow. So now we have step two is actually sign the type data using the SDK. So we'll say const uh, signature is equal to await the helper function here. So we'll say sign type data, it's not a great um, <laughs> function name, <laughs> sign type data with omitted type name. And that's just uh, as explicit as I can be. We'll import that from the helpers function or the helpers file here. And here we need to provide the SDK which we got from the use SDK hook as the first parameter. So we'll say SDK. We'll then say the first parameter is typed data. Typed data dot create follow type data dot typed data dot domain. Sorry, I keep uh, misclicking here, domain. What we can do to make this a bit cleaner is above this, we'll say const and we'll destructure these out of the type data. So we'll say domain, um, domain types and value destructured out of this field here. And then we can just say domain types and value. And it's saying here the SDK might be defined. So let's just quickly say if not SDK, then we'll just return out of this call here. So return, excellent. So now TypeScript is happy with step two. 
we can begin actually calling the function on the smart contract here. To do that, we can use the Thurweb SDK to connect to the smart contract. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say const lens hub which is let's say lens hub contract just to make it more explicit. And we'll say SDK.getContract. And we can use either get contract or get contract from ABI. Get trunk get contract only works with third web deployed contracts. So the one we're interested in is get contract from API. And we need to pass the contract address as well as the actual ABI of the smart contract. So we're going to need the deployed smart contract address here, and we'll need to import the ABI, which we can get from uh, Etherscan. So we'll go ahead and grab those, pull those into constant variables in our application now. To do that, what we can do is go to the lens documentation here. So we go lens docs, and if we go to the deployed contract addresses, here we can find the address for the smart contract that we're supposed to interact with, which is the proxy. So let's copy and paste this smart contract address for lens hub proxy here. And what we'll do is go back to our uh, project here. In this source folder, we'll create a new folder called const. Within this folder, we'll create a file called, uh, let's just call it contracts.ts. And we're going to first export the contract address. And second, we'll export the contract ABI. So first we'll say export const uh, lens contract address, export const lens contract address, and we'll paste in the smart contract address as a string. And just make sure this is the proxy uh, contract, not the lens hub implementation. So you want this value here, OXDB46D. For the actual ABI, we're going to use the lens hub implementation. So we're going to click on this address here. This will take us to polygon scan. And from this page, you can go to the contract tab, scroll all the way down to the bottom. And in this contract ABI section, you'll be able to download the ABI as raw slash text format. This will take you to this page, which is the ABI of the uh, full lens hub implementation. Uh, smart contract. So we can copy and paste this whole text here and we'll paste this into our file. Go back to our contract.ts. We'll say export const lens contract underscore ABI is equal to this value here. And we'll just click save, get some nice auto formatting for our prettier extension here. And now we have the contract address available as well as our contract ABI. What we can do then is connect to our smart contract using those values. So we'll pass in the contract address and the ABI here. So we'll say lens contract address, import that from the uh, const slash contracts file. We'll then use the lens contract ABI as the second parameter here. And we'll await this value. And in the lens hub contract now, you can see we have smart contract is the type after we connect to that. And you just wanna make sure on the underscore app.tsx file, you want to make sure you're on the Polygon network because this function is automatically going to use whatever um, chain you define in this file using the third web provider to look that up and connect to that smart contract using the address and the ABI that you provide. For those wondering what an ABI is, if you're not familiar, it is essentially an interface that defines all of the capabilities of the smart contract. So the contract address is where the contract is deployed. The ABIs are kind of defines all of the inputs and outputs that you would expect of the actual smart contract so that when we connect to it, it understands um, kind of what functions are available and what inputs are required to actually uh, call those functions while we're in this application environment here. Now we have the signature and we've connected to the smart contract. We're ready to kind of manipulate the signature to say, we'll first kind of copy this uh, structure that we saw in the Lens API examples. So we need to sign the type data, which we've done. We then need to split that signature. So we're going to say const VR and, VR and S is equal to a split signature. And we'll import that from our helper function here pass in the signature that we have as a string here. So we'll say signature dot signature. <laughs> it's a pretty bad naming, but signature also has a payload. We're interested in the actual signature itself. So now we've split the signature and we're ready to actually begin calling the smart contract function. If you take a look at the example again, we need to call the follow with sig function and we need to provide a couple of parameters. So let's replicate this inside of our function here. So here we're going to call the smart contract function called follow with sig. 
what we're going to do is we're going to say const result is equal to await lens hub contract. And you can see all of the functionality that we have available. The one we're interested in is call. We need to pass the function name as the first parameter here as a string. So we'll say follow with sig. The second parameter is the parameters that we need to provide. So we know we need to provide the follower, follower, which is the address that is performing the follow, which we can get from the use address hook. So say const address is equal to use address here. We then pass that as the follower parameter here. So follower is the connected wallet address. The next thing we need to provide is the profile IDs, which is an array of users that you're going to follow. We pass that in as a parameter to this follow function here. So we'll say user ID inside of an array. Second thing we need to provide is the datas, which is available on the um, typed data value that we have available here. So we can add the um, datas, I believe it is from this, or value.datas. Which one is it? So it's uh, typed data dot value. It looks like type data dot create follow type data dot type data dot value dot data is here it is. So we can just do value dot data. So we've already destructured that value field out of the type data. So we can just say value dot data is here. And now we need to spread in the signature. So we're going to say sig v r and s. And for the deadline, we'll set type data dot value, uh, we can sorry, say value dot deadline. So that's all we need to do to call the follow with sig function. And what we'll do then is we'll just say console.log the result here, and we'll add a button to call this uh, use follow function hook. One last thing we need to do is to actually export the follow function inside of a use mutation. So we're going to say export, uh, sorry, not export, we'll say return use mutation import that from tanstack slash react query here, and we'll wrap our follow function inside of a mutation so that we can use it inside of a React component as a hook here. So now on our profile page, the ID uh, dynamic route that we created, let's add a button that allows us to follow uh, the user from the connector wallet. So beneath the total followers, let's add a web3 button component. So we import web3 button from at the web dev slash react here. And this button has a field for the contract address. So we're going to use lens underscore contract address here. Hopefully this, there we go. Lens contract address has a field for the contract ABI. So we'll say contract ABI is the lens contract ABI. We can then pass an action, which is what we want to happen when we click this button. So what we're gonna do is at the top of this file, we will just kind of collapse these queries so we can kind of see what's happening. Get rid of this console log here. We're going to import the mutation that we just created. So we're gonna say const mutate is equal to the use follow query. So we'll import that from the lib slash use follow here and we'll open those brackets up. We'll rename mutate to be follow user. So we're going to say open brackets for an arrow function. And what we want to do is call follow user. And within this, we have variables is a string. So what we need to provide here is the ID of the user that we're going to follow. So here we have the profile data dot profile dot ID, I think is what we want. So profile data dot profile dot id and we pass that in and then we can close the web3 button and we can say follow user and we can close this off looks like pretty is just taking its sweet time there we go cool so now we connect to the contract get the abi when the user clicks this button it's going to run this follow user function here the cool thing about this is if we take a look at localhost 3000 and run our dev server here. What happens when we use this web3 button component is it makes sure the user has a connected wallet and then ensures the user is on the Polygon network. And when you click the button in that state, it's going to run this action and start a nice little spinning animation within the button until that transaction is complete. So from our application, let's click on um, the 
Cindy profile here, for example, get taken to the user's profile. We then see this Web3 button component here. And you can see since we haven't connected our wallet yet, we are presented with this connect wallet button. So if I go ahead and connect my wallet here, we then, if we're on the incorrect network, so let's say I switch to Arbitrum Rinkeby, for example, or any other network other than the Polygon network, we see we get presented with this switch network button. So we click this, get taken to the Polygon mainnet, and then it transforms into this follow user function here. So if we go ahead and click this, I'm kind of expecting an error that we're not logged in. So we're going to add the login function into the uh, hook that we created. So user is not authenticated, as you can see here. We need to actually add the login into the follow user here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say, within the use follow hook, let's add a ability to log in. So we'll say const, uh, empty object is equal to use login. We'll import that from our use login hook. And what we're gonna do here is we'll grab the mutate async out of this and we'll say login user. Inside the follow function, the first thing we're going to do is actually login. So we'll say await login user and then we can continue on with our logic. So here on the homepage, should have a queue I'm not sure what that means. Um, I think we just need to give it a quick refresh. There we go. So now we connect our wallet with MetaMask. We are on the correct network. We click follow user. It's first going to ask us to log in. We can sign that message. It's then going to continue on. So we have this message coming back from Lens. And here is the EIP 712 standard in action. So we have the profile IDs ready that we're going to follow and all of this information presented. And it's not just a kind of raw byte string that's being presented to the user. It's kind of more meaningful to say, here's what's happening when you sign this message. We sign it, then we are asked to sign a transaction to actually perform the follow with signature function on the Lens Hub smart contract. So if we go ahead and confirm this transaction, we'll see that this is going to run that smart contract con um, smart contract transaction, and this is going to be pending until that result comes back. Excellent, so that looks like it's gone through. I think we didn't have that nice spinning animation, so let's go back to our ID here. I think the cause of that is we need to await this. So let's say async, and we'll await this, uh, follow user function, and instead of mutate, we'll say mutate async, follow user, and let's go to a different person's profile now. And what will happen is let's go to this person, for example. Uh, looks like we have a small issue in the ID or the URL here. So let's say 77, this one here. Let's just quickly fix that up while we're here. And beneath the followers, let's click our connect wallet. We are now on the correct network. Let's follow this user. And you can see now we're awaiting the results of this until this function is complete. This button becomes disabled. It also has this nice loading animation here. And we can again go through the process to follow this user. We sign the message and then sign the transaction to send that information to the blockchain. So again, this spins and spins and spins until the transaction goes through. And then from there, the button will go back to normal and appear as a follow user. There we go. This gives you the tools to perform any action that you want, whether it's reading or writing data to the Lens protocol. And what I mean by that is you have the GraphQL queries available inside of the API examples source slash GraphQL folder here. So you can feel free to get any query or mutation from this example repository provided by Lens. You can pass that into our GraphQL code gen setup, get the React hooks and mutations ready to use inside of your functions. When you're ready to interact with the smart contracts, you can go into the source folder. Let's say you want to mirror something, you can go to publications and click on mirror or click on comment or click on any of these functions such as post. You can see this exact same three-step process for anything that you wanna do on Lens. So you see, you get the type data, which again, you'll just use that GraphQL mutation to say, hey, Lens, give me the information that I need to ask the user to sign it, which is step two. 
sign that type data, and then send that information to the smart contract with the parameters outlined in the examples here. So this gives you the power to really go wild and add any kind of functionality that you want into the application built on top of the setup that we've set out in this video so far. One thing I wanted to show you is you can actually upload uh, metadata to IPFS as part of some of these function calls. So for example, if you're creating a post, as we mentioned in those earlier diagrams, the contents for the post itself is not stored on chain. You need to upload the content to IPFS or decentralized storage, wherever you're storing your information about the post on off-chain storage, and then upload that link here in the content URI field to the actual smart contract. So one last thing I wanted to show you is how you can perform this upload to IPFS step before you're actually performing the write to the smart contract itself. So we'll go ahead and add the capability to create new posts onto the Lens protocol within our application now. So we'll head back to the uh, header component here and let's add a link. So we'll say div class name equals styles.left and within this, we'll have the logo and we'll have another link that links to the create page, slash create. And within here, we'll have a create text, close that off. There we go. And we'll need to add the styles here. So let's say header dot module dot CSS and we'll say dot left display flex, flex direction row and align item center and we'll have a gap between so it's a gap 12 pixels or 16 pixels and we'll check that out on our localhost so now inside of the header we have a link to the create page we'll need to actually create that file inside of our pages directory so they create.tsx and add some quick boilerplate code in here just to actually create the page so we'll say create with a capital c get rid of the type props here and we'll say hello from create page. So now if we go back to localhost 3000 slash create, we can see our component is rendering here and we're ready to add uh, the capability to upload metadata to IPFS before we upload that information to a call to the smart contract. What we'll do on this page is we'll first create the create.module.css file and we'll split that over here. What we're gonna do is just add a very basic form where you can input a file that will upload to IPFS. We'll input a title field, a description, and a content field. So pretty much all other stuff you would expect of uh, a social media application where you upload and attach media. You can have a title for your post, a description, and then the actual content of that uh, publication. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say dot uh, form container, dot form container as the styles here we'll have a dot input container. We'll then have the dot input itself, I think. We'll say input, we'll see how it ends up turning out. So the wrapper, after we import these styles here, we'll say import styles from the styles slash create.module.css. Our top level div is a class name of styles.form container. And we'll have a, we're not gonna use an actual form, we're going to use some state. So we'll say const um, image, set image is equal to use state, import that from React. We'll say that's either a file or null. We'll have a title, which is going to be a string. We'll say title is string. We'll have description and we'll have content. Cool, so within the form container, we're going to have an input of type image. So this is going to be input for the image, input of type file. On change, let's set the state of the file here. So I'm just gonna hope Copilot kind of guides us with this syntax. So we have an input for the file. This is going to be wrapped in a div of class name styles input container, wrap that in a div. Then we'll kind of replicate the same logic for the title and description. So I'll have input for the title. This is going to be a text input. So it's a input um, type here, text. Placeholder is title, that looks good to me. 
We'll close that div off. We'll do the same for the description and the content. So we'll say again for the description input container, we'll have a text area, which is a placeholder of description. And we need to update the state every time we type into this text area. We need to do the same for the input up here. So we'll say on change set title. So every time the user types a letter into the title field that will get reflected in state. Every time the user types a value into the description that will get reflected in state. And we'll do the same for the content here. So we'll do class name and put text area. Placeholder is content. Every time the user types, we'll update that value in state and we'll close that div off. Cool. So now we'll just add some quick little styles here. We'll say form container uh, max width is equal to 800 pixels. We'll say display. I will do a wrapping div around this whole thing. So we'll say div, close that off, and we'll do div to wrap this entire thing. We'll say class name equals styles.container. The container is going to be the full width. So we'll say container width 100%. We'll add a display of flex. Flex direction is column. Align items to the center, justify content center. We'll then set this to have a max width of 800. We'll have a display of flex. Flex direction is going to be set to con um, flex direction, sorry, set to column. And we'll align item center and justify center as well here. We'll just set the input container to width is 100%. We'll have some padding of 16 pixels. We'll have some margin, 16 pixels as well. And we'll have a nice little border around it. So it's a one pixel solid white. And border radius is one pixel solid white. Sorry, the border radius should be 16 pixels. And that looks good to me. So we'll get rid of the input. Check out what this looks like on our page here. Um, I was hoping this would be in the center. So justify content center. Uh, let's get rid of this and see if it changes anything. Okay, this is fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with this. So let's see here. We can choose a file. Let's upload the image here. We can add a title. Hello world. My description, my content. And let's console log this just to make sure it's all working. Console.log the image, title, description, and content here. We'll check this out in the description. Oh, nice, it's now centered. That's what I was hoping for. So we can see we have in the description, uh, what are we doing? Console.log content on the create page. Here we go, content is content by content. So you can see all of the values are being reflected. So every time you change the value of the input that's being reflected in state here, for each of the four input fields that we have available. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to add a submit button that's going to upload this metadata to IPFS and then continue on with that kind of three-step flow where we get the signed type data back from the Lens API, we sign it, and then we continue with the smart contract call. This time we'll pass the URL that we have from IPFS into the uh, parameters of the call to the smart contract. So to do that, what we can do is go to our lib folder and let's say use create post.ts. And what we're going to do within here is take a look again at the API examples. And if you look at the create post.ts example here, you'll be able to see the same structure. So we request that information back from the GraphQL API, which is our step one. Second step is to sign that type data. The third step is still to call the function on the smart contract, which happens down here. So post with SIG. What the step in between here is we need to actually upload the metadata to IPFS. So we're saying upload IPFS and we'll use the web storage to do this. Upload all of the actual content of the post. We then create a post uh, kind of object here where the content URI is set to that IPFS hash where we store and upload the metadata of our post. We can then set things like the collect module information and the reference module information. We then use the same flow where we sign that message, split the signature and send that information all along with the smart contract call here. So we're going to kind of replicate this inside of our function here. We're going to first upload it to IPFS and then continue with that flow that hopefully you're familiar with by now where we have this kind of three-step process. So let's add the ability to add uh, IPFS uploads now. 
what we'll do in this function is we'll say export default use create post and we'll outline the steps in here again and we're going to create the async function um, create post export default function up here sorry create post and what we'll do within this is accept the uh, metadata of the post that we submit from the content or the create page here. So we'll accept the image title, description and content. So the image is either a file or null. So let's just say file. The title is a string. The description is a string and the content is a string as well. So let's write that uh, function here. And then again, we'll follow the same pattern where we define the actual function. And then what we return is the use mutation imported from Tansac React Query wrapping that create post function inside of the hook here. So again, we're going to follow the exact same three-step pattern. Hopefully this is uh, kind of getting familiar by now. So we ask a lens to give us the sign of uh, the typed data. We then sign the type data. And then we use the, use the signed typed data to send the transaction Let's just close this uh, CSS file transaction to the smart contract. Now we're only adding a step here to say upload some media to IPFS beforehand and use that in the uh, request. So first thing we need to do again, the very first thing we always do is we get the uh, GraphQL query. Let's bring this over here. GraphQL query for uh, creating a post from the API examples folder. So we'll go source and we'll go GraphQL. We'll then go to create post here. Create post or post, uh, post.graphql, here we go. So we can see create post type data. This is what we want. So we'll copy the value here. We'll create a new file called post.graphql. And within this little folder here, where is it? GraphQL, so add a new file called post.graphql. We'll then slam this into our uh, file here, copy and paste that into our project. And the next step is to use the npm run cogen command to generate that uh, React query mutation for us. So we're going to look in the generated.ts for the new GraphQL that we just added. Uh, which one was it? We added the post.ts, post.graphql rather. So we get use create post type data mutation is what I'm expecting to see. So say use create post type data mutation and we can import that from our use create post function now. So at the top of the file, we're going to say uh, const mutate async is equal to use create post mutation uh, sorry, not use create post. Uh, what am I saying? Use create post typed data mutation. And that is going to allow us to request the data from the GraphQL API. So we're going to say request typed data is the name of this function. And as always, the first step is to ask lens for the type data. So down here, we're going to say const typed data is equal to await request typed data. And within here, what we need to pass is the request. And here it is a little bit more detailed. So we need to provide all of these fields such as the collect module, content URI, and the profile ID. We can optionally provide a reference module and the gated flag. And you can always go back to the Lens API examples folder and take a look at what uh, criteria you need to pass in here. So for example, if we go to post.ts rather than comment here, you'll see all of the metadata that we need to pass in this object here. So we need the profile ID, content URI, everything you can pass in as an option as the collect module and the reference module if you want to do so here. So always remember, if you're confused of what you need to pass in, you can use the API examples repository that is available on GitHub here. And that will be linked in the description if you wanna check it out. So let's go back to our code. And in this request, we need to provide a few things. We need to provide the collect module, Within here, I believe we need to provide one of these modules. So we'll say free collect module, and we can say follower only is equal to false. So everybody can collect this for free. I believe that's what that means. And we also need to provide the content URI, and this is our IPFS 
hash. So to do upload to IPFS beforehand. And we'll say XXX for now, just to always oh, we'll say to do here. So we come back to that. The profile ID is the profile that we're actually publishing to. So again, we can get that from the use lens user hook. So we say const uh, profile query or whatever it's called is equal to use lens user, import that from line three here. So within this object, we can import the profile query and we can add the profile query dot data dot default profile dot ID here. So this is which profile we're going to add it to. And that is our request. So we're going to send this information to the Lens API. It's then going to come back with the typed data that we can use to sign. So again, we can use the helper function that we wrote previously to sign the type data with omitted type name. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say const um, signature is equal to await sign typed data with omitted type name. We're going to then import the use SDK hook. So say const SDK is equal to use SDK from third web dev slash react on line two here. We're then going to pass the SDK as first parameter. We're going to pass the typed data dot create post type data dot type data <laughs> dot um, domain in here. We're going to copy the same kind of destructuring format as we did in the previous ones. We're simply const is equal to this. We can then destructure all of these fields out of that object. So we'll say domain types and value. We'll pass these in here. So we'll say domain types and value. We'll again say if there's not an SDK for some reason, then we'll just return out of this function that realistically shouldn't ever happen. So we have the request back from Lens, we're signing it and we're ready to send that on step three to the uh, smart contract here. But before we create this request for the type data, we need to upload our metadata that we're passing in as parameters here to IPFS. So let's go ahead and add the capability to do that. To do that, we can dive into the third web storage documentation. So we'll go the portal.thirdweb.com, we'll go to storage and we'll go to upload to IPFS from the front end environment here. So you can see we have the use storage upload hook available from the thirdweb dev slash react package. Let's go ahead and import this into our project here. So let's say use SDK, use storage upload from the thirdweb dev slash react package. Then we can use the mutate async from the use upload storage hook. And we'll rename that to upload to IPFS here. Sweet, so in this request, we're sending the content URI field, which is gonna to point to an IPFS, but what are we actually gonna store at that IPFS uh, URL? The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna upload the actual image to IPFS. So we'll store the image itself in IPFS. We'll then create an object of metadata for a post that comes from uh, kind of standard fields from Lens and we'll use the Lens API example to help us with what fields we need for that. What we're going to do then is we're going to upload that whole object to IPFS as well. So we'll kind of have the image living on IPFS pointing to a URL. We'll then upload a object containing things like the title, the description and the content, as well as the URL for the image all to IPFS as well. So the first step is to get the const image IPFS URL equals upload, uh, wait upload to IPFS. And we're gonna pass in the actual image here. Or what do we need to do? Data, and we'll pass in image. So data expects an array. So we'll say data is equal to image. And we'll just double check that in the documentation here. So you can see data to upload. Const URIs is equal to await upload data, data to upload. Excellent, so this will be an array of strings. So let's grab the zeroth element of this and we'll wrap this in brackets to say, get that. Excellent, so now IPFS URL is a string. We'll grab the first IPFS hash. Since we're only uploading one thing, we can expect that there will only be one item in this array and we'll assign that to the image IPFS URL here. So the second step is to, let's say zero B, is to upload the actual content to IPFS. So this is going to be a uh, object which 
contains the image field as well. So we'll have things like the title, the description, and the image set in an object, and we'll upload that object to IPFS. So for example, let's say const uh, post metadata is equal to object, and then we're going to say const um, post metadata IPFS URL is equal to, and we'll do the exact same thing, we'll upload to IPFS and grab the first result here. So we'll say await upload to IPFS, we'll upload the actual object itself, and that will have a separate IPFS URL as well. And again, you can see what kind of metadata you need to provide in the object in the example. So you can see here, we need to upload things like the version, the main content focus, the ID, a description, a language, content itself, all of these aspects available. So we're going to use this object here. So we'll copy and paste this in. And what we can do is set that to our post metadata here. So you can see, we'll need to import publication main focus. We'll then need to use the unique identifier here. So this is a library itself. So it's a UUIDv4. We'll grab this from NPM so that we can create a unique identifier for our post. So we can say yarn add or NPM install UUIDv4. Let's go ahead and add that quickly into our project. So say yarn add UUIDv4. And at the top of our file, what we need to do is add the ability to generate that UUID. So here on line two, we'll import v4 as UUID v4 and set that as the unique identifier for our post. So we'll close that, it looks like it's installed. We'll close these off. And you can see now we, um, this doesn't exist apparently, so we'll say, do we want an image to be the main focus or a link or text? Let's just say we want the image or the text to be the main focus. You can feel free to choose whatever you want depending on the kind of metadata that you're uploading. So the version is going to be 2.0. The main content focus is what kind of post you're creating. Is it a text post? Is it an article? Is it an image? Is it a video, et cetera, et cetera. The UUID is the unique identifier for our post. This is necessary if you're uploading to IPFS. So here's where we can actually populate the contents that we passed in as parameters. So for example, the description here will set to our description variable. We'll then set the content variable to our content. We'll leave the local uh, to ENUS. There's no external URL. We do have an image. So let's point to the image IPFS URL that we posted up here image mime type, you can set that to be uh, image slash PNG or whatever you choose to do. I'm just gonna leave it blank. And the name is the title of our post. So let's see, title is here. So now we're passing image title description content into the actual object that gets generated. We can feel free to add any tags. I'm just gonna leave this empty. And for the app ID, I don't believe we have one. So let's just get rid of that for now. So now we upload the image to IPFS. We then create this object containing that image URL on this line here. We then upload that full object to IPFS. Now we can use this object to uh, be the content URI. So this is the URL where our content is stored at. And just so we can visualize that as we call this function, let's console.log this and we'll console.log this as well. So console.log image IPFS URL. When that's uploaded, we'll form this object. We'll then upload that object to IPFS. We can then say, okay, now we have this link that we can point to inside the content URI. So we can get rid of this to do. And now we can request that information, sign that, and then begin this kind of step three here where we use the smart contract to actually call that create post with SIG function. I was just looking at the example and I believe we might need the reference module here. And we can just say, um, follow only reference module can be set to false. So let's say we have a reference module now and the collect module, we then store the content URI and the profile ID. So all of these fields are populated in the request. And now we can begin this step to actually uh, send that information to the smart contract. So again, we're going to use the same logic as we did in the use follow where we connect to the smart contract using the contract address and the ABI. And then we call the function with the string here as a function name and the object as the parameters. So what we're gonna do is just gonna copy and paste this from the previous hook that we created. And we'll copy that into our use create post. So we'll first connect to the smart contract. We'll need to import these two constant values 
on line number 10 here. We'll also need the other one. So we'll say lens contract ABI. And now we connect to the smart contract and what we'll do is we'll start to actually call that function. So we'll say const result is equal to await lens hub contract dot call. And here's where we want to specify the name of the function and the object. From the example, you can see all of the fields that we need to provide. So we have post with SIG, needs profile ID, content URI, collect module, all of this information here. So let's go ahead and run this uh, sign create post type data, split the signature, and then we'll use these fields outlined here to actually do this function call. So we'll say the function name is called post with SIG. The, whoops, second, uh, parameter here is an object containing all of these fields. But before we even do that, we actually need to split the signature. So let's say const VRS is equal to split signature from the helpers file and pass signature dot signature in here. So then I'm just going to bring this example off screen so I can cheat a little bit. What we need to do is provide the profile ID is a first parameter here. And to do that, we can get the, um, value out of here. So we can say typed data dot create post type data dot typed data dot value. And here is all the stuff that we need. So again, let's change this up to destructure it, destructure the stuff we need out of the typed data dot value field. So we'll say const const empty bracket is equal to this. So typed data dot create post blah, 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 blah. And now if we hit control space here, we'll be able to see all of the things that we can destructure out of this. So we'll say collect module, all of the stuff we need, content URI, deadline, nonce, profile ID, and reference module, reference module, init data. And these are all the fields that we need. So we're going to say profile ID. Then for the content URI, this is going to be content URI. We'll say collect module and collect module init data. We'll say reference module, reference module, init data. We then need to use the SIG, so SIG and the V, R, and S. And finally, the deadline is equal to the deadline here. It doesn't look like we need the non, so let's just get rid of that one. And we can console.log the data or the results, sorry. Sweet, so now we've done that three-step process. We requested the information from the Lens Protocol API. We sign that information and then we pass that signature to the parameters of the smart contract call here. It looks like it's complaining that we can't set this function with four parameters if it were using the use mutation. So I wonder if we can convert the parameters here to be an object containing these instead. And this, let's refactor this to create a type. So let's say uh, type post, uh, create post arg, sounds good. Image file, title string, description content, content. And let's say this is expected to be this type. Let's get rid of all of these. And then we should be able to export this. So. I think with use mutations, you can only pass one uh, parameter if you're doing it this way. Uh, it's a little bit weird that it is like that, but that's okay. We can just refactor it a little bit by doing this and pass an object in and instead of kind of four parameters here. So with that done, we're ready to actually use the function on the create page. So let's go ahead and add the button on this page down here now. Again, we're going to use the web three button. So we'll say web three button, whoops, web three button, import that from the react package. We'll use the contract address is equal to lens contract address, contract ABI is equal to lens contract ABI. Let's import both of these. And the action is going to be the mutate async of the use create post. So we'll say const mutate async is equal to use create post. We'll then rename this to be um, create post. And on the action here, we'll have an arrow function async await create post. And we need to provide some fields in here. So we'll provide the image title description and content into that function. 
we'll then close this off. Um, let's say the image is saying it needs to be either file or null. So we'll just change this to make sure you have uh, an image before we actually call this. So we say if not image, then return, just so that we can ignore this TypeScript error here. Um, and this way we'll need to return this if we're doing curly brackets. Awesome, so now when we click the button on the page, let's go to our local history 1000 here, quickly get rid of these things in the console here. Uh, we need a <laughs> need some text for the Web3 button. So we'll quickly change this and say, create post. That looks a bit better. Not sure what this uh, styling is, but as again, I'm not here to teach you CSS. So let's just pretend it looks all good. For the file, let's add our file in here. Let's add a title, my post, my post description and my post content here. So you can see this is all updating live in the state values that we have here. The file is set, the title, the description, the content. If we click create posts now, uh, I believe one more thing we needed to do was actually uh, log in. So let's make sure we log in before we do this. So we say const mutate async login equals use login. And we'll just make sure that the user is signed in before they do this. So in the step here, um, when they call the function, let's say you must be logged in. So let's say login and await login user. So let's just quickly add that before we call it. Render more hooks than the previous. Sorry about that. We're going to have to fill the form out again once more here. Well, then my title, my description, my content. And as you can see, we need to connect our wallet. Once we are connected, we can click the create post button here. We get this nice animation. We need to log in first. We then need to sign the message that comes back from the Lens API. This is uploading to IPFS. As you can see, the image is uploaded at this URL here. We're then uploading the object to IPFS containing that image. And then we should see a signature pop up on the top right here we go. So this is the message to um, create the post kind of signed type data. So here's the message that gets back and formatted. So you can see here's the content URI. Here's all of the information about what we're signing. Let's go ahead and sign that. We can then actually call the post with SIG transaction. So here we go. We're actually going to create a post onto the Lens protocol. If we go ahead and confirm this when that transaction goes through this button will stop spinning and our post will be successfully published to the Lens protocol. I actually ran into some problems with the main content focus being image here. I'm not sure what caused that. If I change it to text only, then we can still assign an image and the text. We can go through the same process again, log in and sign the message and approve the transaction here we get a successful result. I'm not sure if you will have trouble with the main content focus as I did. I'm not sure what the issue was there, but if we just change it to be text, it seems to work for me. So let's go ahead and go through this process again. Click the confirm on post with SIG, and hopefully this time it will show up on our profile here. So wait for this transaction to go through. This time we're making a text post and we'll double check it shows up on our profile. As I was saying uh, previously in our diagram, you do need to wait a little bit for the posts to be indexed by the Lens GraphQL sort of web two stack and then query that so you can actually read that on the UI. So if we go to our profile here, should be able to see the post on our profile here now. There we go. So here is my text only post with the content of hi. I'm not sure what happened with that uh, publication main focus field. Hopefully you don't run into that same error as I did. But you can see now we've uploaded all of this information to IPFS and we have set the title, the description and the content in here as well. You might be thinking, where is our image here? It's not showing up, which is a good question. So I did some digging and the image actually doesn't come back in the profile, uh, the publication query. So what we can do to change that, and this is a good example of how you can edit any of the information you want back from the GraphQL, is in the get publications query. You can see for each item, we're getting the post fields fragment on the post. So if we search this up, 
the fragment post field inside of the common GraphQL file here. You can see we have the ID of the post, the profile information, the stats, and the metadata. If we take a look at this fragment here, you can see we have the fragment metadata output fields. There's no image field being returned here. So you can see, let's just go ahead and add the image and then let's run NPM run code gen. This is going to update our query to return the image field and we can display that on the UI here. So let's go ahead and say inside of the generated file now, if we look up the use publications query, can see this GraphQL query will now have an image uh, image property here. It's not the best way to view it, but it is now available. So what we can do is on our feed post item component, let's render the image if there is one. So we'll say source is equal to publication dot metadata dot image or the uh, next kind of previous setup that we had here. And we can change this condition here to say if the publication.metadata.image or this is greater than zero. So we'll add a bit more of a complex condition here. Then we'll show either the image or the original URL. So let's double check this on the UI here. And as you can see, we have the images rendering on our post feed now. So you can see we have the title, the contents, and we're rendering the image that's coming from IPFS here as well. So we can see we stored the image at IPFS. All of the metadata is also stored at IPFS and we're also pulling this down, displaying it onto the UI here. And that kind of shows you how you don't actually just have to accept what is available in these fragments or in these queries that you get from the examples. You can pick and choose which fields you want and pull the required information that you want for the pages that you have and customize those to your needs as well. Finally, we can use Vercel to go ahead and deploy our project. So let's just type Vercel into the command line. If you don't have it installed like me, you can do npm i slash g Vercel to install the Vercel CLI. And this will allow us to deploy our project from the command line here. So let's quickly wait for this to install. Excellent. And then what we can do is just run Vercel from the root of our project. I'm going to be using GitHub here. And this will bring us a URL open in our browser. We'll log in to our uh, Vercel account, set one up if you don't already have one. You can then set up and deploy. Let's just click yes here. Let's select the uh, scope that you want to deploy to. So this is the project or the team that you want to deploy to. I'm just going to deploy to my personal one. Link to an existing project. Let's say no. What is our project's name? Let's just say my lens app. That sounds good. The code is located in the root directory here. So let's just say the root project. And this is going to upload all of our code to the cell. And we don't want to change any of these settings, I don't believe. So let's just say no, I don't want to modify these. And this is going to upload and deploy our project to the cell here. Awesome. So it looks like it is done. We can click into this URL that is deployed for us. And that will take us to our live deployment where you can feel free to share this URL around, send it to your friends or whatever you want to do with it. And that is our deployed URL. You can see this works with our MetaMask accounts. We can sign in with Lens again. We can do all of the actions that we were doing on our localhost environment now on this deployed URL. So you made it to the end of the build. I'm very happy to see you here and I hope you enjoyed building this out as much as I did making it. Hopefully it found you a lot of value in improving your skills in building Web3 applications and just building in the front end world as well. Very excited to see you at the end. Great job on making it this far. If you enjoyed this build, if you've got any value out of it, please remember to hit the like button. It does help me out, get this video recommended to more people and grow my channel so that we can start making more and more videos like this. If you wanna see those videos in the future, feel free to subscribe to the channel, jump into the communities in the description. And with that said, thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.